Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends, guys, happy frickin' new year, and welcome back to a mega compilation of the best Karen stories that I've read on this channel in 2022. These stories are some of mine and Steve-O's absolute favorites, like we've got Karen's calling 911 on ridiculous things, stealing people's cars, houses, babies, wheelchairs, you name it. They're also attacking police, attacking dogs, hitting grandmas. It's all here in this super duper entitled episode. So if you guys have missed some stories over this year, trust me, the most entitled ones are in this episode. So guys, I hope you enjoy today's stories and myself and Steva will be back tomorrow business as usual with a juicy episode for you. Okay, so on this day, I was on an airplane, and right when we landed, a Karen in the back unbuckled and darts to the front of the plane to get off first. She didn't make any eye contact with anybody, and she felt that she was special. Like, I'm talking about going from the very last seat on the plane, down the whole row, past the first class, basically standing in the little kitchen thing in the front. All this time, the seatbelt sign was still on, and we were rolling down the runway. The flight crew had asked her to return to her seat until we reached the gate, but she wasn't even responding and she was ignoring them. Everyone was basically trying to just wait it out. It was a long flight, like 8 hours, and at this point we were exhausted anyway and nobody said a word. Suddenly, the captain announced that we had a special guest on board, and he'll be coming out to greet after we were settled at the gate. Now, the Karen stood there awkwardly until we did this whole rolling to the gate and whatever planes do when they land for about 15 to 20 minutes. Everybody sat there waiting to see what the captain was talking about. Eventually, the captain came out, and he asked the lady to please move back a little so he could get to a special guest. And then a little more, and then a little more, and then a little more. He was looking from row to row, trying to find a specific person. Everyone's watching and looking around to see who it could be. He kept going and going and asking the Karen to please step back a few more steps each time. Finally, as they approached the rear of the plane, he asked her to sit down for a second while he grabs the intercom at the rear of the plane. He then says out loud, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to announce our special guest sitting in seat 42C. Let's give her a round of applause. And with that, the whole plane went wild with laughter and applause. I loved every moment of that. Absolutely brilliant, right? Guys, I once flew on a flight like that where a loud group of people ran to the front to get off first. And the funniest thing happened, we ended up deplaning from the rear doors, not the front. That was incredible. So the next story was submitted by a guy named Yash, and it's such a crazy encounter with the Karen guys. Okay, so this story took place years ago, back in 2003. I was only 30 years old at the time, and I was at my local Walmart after work one day. I had told this story to one of my coworkers, who suggested that I send you this email. Anyways, my wife had gotten me to stop by Walmart after work, to pick up a few things for dinner. Now I do want to note that on this day, I was working as a software engineer, so I was wearing jeans, dress shoes, a nice dark navy polo, and a lanyard around my neck with a work ID, so I guess I could have been mistaken for a manager of some sort. I don't know. Thinking back, I should have totally stuck that ID into my pocket. Now, back then, I had no idea that these people were called Karens. To me, this was just a delusional woman who was off her meds. So on one hot summer day in July, I guess I got to meet what you kids nowadays call a mega Karen, who happened to be completely bonkers. Stay with me. On this day, I was in the frozen food aisle, looking for some frozen lasagna, when out of the corner of my eye, a woman who looked to be in her 80s was in a wheelchair. She was trying to reach a frozen McCain cake on the middle shelf in the freezer. Now I offered to help her, of course, as I wasn't going to turn away from an elder needing help. So I grab her the cake, she thanks me and she goes on her way. I then grab my lasagna and I was going to check out, when all of a sudden I hear, Hey, now that you're done helping her, come help me get this off the top shelf. Now I do continue walking along whistling to myself when this woman screams, Hey, I'm talking to you. Don't ignore me. At this point, I turn around to see an older woman, maybe in her mid-50s, standing there with her arms crossed and she looks upset at me. I then look at her and say, Excuse me? Karen says, Yeah, I need help grabbing something off the top shelf. I tell her, I'm sorry, you're asking the wrong person, I'm not an employee. She says, Listen, I know you're the manager and it's not your job to help people find things, but I saw you help that old lady, so you have to help me. Now, at this point, I'm thinking to myself, oh, she must think I'm the manager of the store by the way I dress. I then tell her, oh, you're, you're mistaken. I'm not an employee of Walmart's. I'm just shopping like you are. 
The woman then begged me to go help her grab the item she wanted. Now at this point, a lot of people might have walked off, but I'm about 6 foot 5 and I decided, hey, why not? She's a short woman, so maybe I'll walk her to where it is, grab her whatever she wants from the top shelf, and then be on my way home. Quick and easy, right? Wrong. I follow Karen to the outdoor section, where she then proceeds to ask me to grab a huge box from the top shelf. She looks at me and says, Okay, I need you to go get a ladder or whatever you use to grab that box off the top shelf for me. I then say to her, Whoa, 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 I'm, I'm so sorry. I thought I was helping you reach something higher up. I had no idea I need a ladder. You're going to have to find an actual employee to do that. After I said this, something then flips in her brain and she looks at me and says, Well, then go get an effing ladder. How did you become a store manager if you're so stupid? Now, when she said this, I immediately start walking away. I told her I'm not helping her, that I'm going to pay for my lasagna and go home. I'm walking off while she's screaming insults at me that she's going to call corporates and get me fired. At the time, I then made the mistake of saying, Hey, I'm not an employee. Even if I was, you talking to me like this makes me not want to help you even more. The delusional Karen then says, Listen, it's already bad enough that you're dark-skinned. I'm white. You have to help me. If you don't, I'll tell everybody what a racist you are for not helping a white woman. And I'm sure corporate would love to hear that. Now, I do want to note that 9-11 was still pretty fresh in everybody's minds in 2003, and I'm pretty sure she was referring to that. We're going in circles at this point, and I'm no longer listening to her because why should I? She then says something I'll never forget. The woman literally points a finger in my face, gets really close, and with the creepiest dead smile on her face, she says, If you don't help me, I'm gonna go to my car, I'm gonna grab my gun, and I'm gonna make you help me. You're lucky I don't have it on me right now, or you'd be in trouble. Okay, so she just threatened me, and I'm actually getting nervous at this point. I tell her, okay, I'm gonna go to the back, I'm gonna grab the ladder ma'am, I'm gonna be right back. Now, I could have easily left the store, but I didn't want this crazy woman potentially harming some other innocent employee if her threats were true. I decide to go off and search for any employee right now. I end up finding one, and I ask him to call the real manager, and maybe get security, as this woman was completely Looney Tunes. About five minutes later, the supervisor and Walmart security comes. I explain to them that there's a woman who just threatened to go to her car and grab her gun if I don't help her grab this box from the top shelf. The supervisor on shifts wondering if she should actually help the crazy woman grab the box to allow her to leave calmly, or just get security to escort her out at this point. They figured helping her might be the best thing to do, just in case she was going to go through with the threats. But security mentioned that they didn't want to endanger any employees just in case she is crazy, and the best course of action was to call police and let security handle it at this point. So I lead them back to her, and as soon as she sees security, this woman goes ballistic. She's screaming that they'll never get her out of the store and that she'd rather die than let a brown-skinned idiot kick her out of Walmart. She then screams, Ugh, can't a white woman get some help from these effing immigrants anymore? If you don't help me, what good are you to the country? You don't belong in this country. Now this happened so quick, but security actually went to grab her arm at this point to escort her out, but she wasn't giving up the fight. She ended up slapping and clawing the security guard, who was then left with no choice but to throw her to the ground. People were crowding around watching the woman fight and squirm, screaming every racist thing she could, and screaming that she's got a gun in her car and that everybody's dead. It took two security guards to get this woman under control. Security ended up pulling her out of the store as police rolled up to arrest her. The whole time, she was screaming at the police that they're white and they shouldn't be arresting her. I had to stay and give a police report while the woman was handcuffed and put in the back of the police cruiser. The whole time she was in the back of the cruiser, she was screaming that she didn't mean the thing she said and that she was sorry and to just let her go home and it'll never happen again. She then starts screaming about leaving the stove on at home and that her house was going to burn down if she doesn't go home now. We all assumed that this woman had some sort of mental disorder going on. I don't know what happened to her after that and I'm assuming she got charged. Also, no idea if the cops ever searched her vehicle either, because I was told I could leave. And at the time, the officers were going inside to look at the store cameras. To this day, I do wonder what happened to her. She's gotta be in her 70s or even 80s by now. Guys, what a crazy, wild story. And like Opie said, that woman might have been suffering from some sort of mental disorder, and she might have not even had a weapon in her car. What a terrifying threat to make to a stranger though, and I'm glad nobody was harmed at the end. 
Okay, so for a little backstory, I live in a nice house. It's right on the beach, and I do take good care of it and my garden, so it's not strange to see people admiring my home when they're on walks. Also, I don't like driving, so I usually bike everywhere, and I do have a pool in my backyard. On to the story. So I just had a long day at work and had a few groceries with me on my bike. As I pull into my street, I see a line of people blocking my driveway. Like, full blocking. I pull onto the sidewalk and start walking my bike towards the group. Now, the people in the story are Karen and her two friends. And her kids. The three of them are standing in a group, and I overhear a woman talking about how she's so happy for Karen, and how beautiful her new home is. Now, I'm thinking, hmm, that's odd. I don't recall any house around me being for sale or sold to anybody, so I try to pass the group of women to get to my garage. I say out loud, hey, can I get past please? Now, the Karen just says, go around, can't you see we're busy? Now at this I say, oh, I just need to drop my bike in the garage, and then I'll be out of your way. I'm glad you like the house though, I do try to take care of it. Now at this point, friend number one says, um, I think you might be confused, Karen lives here. I say to the group, no. This is my house, I live here, I don't know her at all. At this, Karen chimes in and says, Okay, you're obviously trying to break into my house. Get away before I call the police. And I say to them, No, you need to leave. This is my house. At this, Karen screams, I will not get off my property. Now, at this point, I just push past and head towards the garage. And that's when I hear the splashing in my backyard. Now, nobody should be in my pool. I drop my bike, run to the backyard, and see three kids swimming in my swimming pool. Okay, I've had enough of whatever's going on. I raise my voice, and I tell them to get out. Two kids get out, but they're obviously confused, while one boy stays in. The kid that stays in says, My mommy says I can swim. Go away. I told him, No, this is my pool. I'm so sorry, but you're not allowed to be here. This is my home. Now, Karen hears this, and she marches up to me and says, Hey, don't talk to my son like that. Get off my property. Now, at this point, her two friends are looking confused, and she says, Karen, what's going on? Who's this girl? Now, I'm panicking at this point with a mix of rage, and I said, Well, prove it. Prove that you live here. Karen's second friend starts to pull her away, and she says, Hey, Karen, why don't we just go inside? The kid shouldn't be around this. Karen's friend then looks at me and says, if I don't get off this property, they'll have no choice but to call the police. I said, no, you're not going into my home. And Karen says, yes, we are. We're going inside. Now go away before I call the police. Now, I don't know what this woman's trying to do, but this is clearly not going to work. I then said to her, fine, go inside. I dare you to get in. At this point, Karen leads her group of friends away, and then the group climbs the stairs, and obviously she didn't think this through. Only two keys to this house exist. One key for me, and one key for my sister. I can see and hear the woman at my front door, telling her friends that she must have grabbed the wrong key, and that they're locked outside now. I then lock up my bike, grab my groceries, and push past them, saying, Excuse me, if you don't mind, I'm going into my home. Her two friends look at me in disbelief as I unlock the door with my key, go inside, and shut the door. As I close the door and lock it, Karen's banging on my door, screaming how she's gonna call the cops on me for breaking into her home. I ended up calling the cops on her. So the group of women end up standing in my yard for a little while longer, while Karen was acting furious that someone was in her house. She then ran off as soon as she saw the cop cars, and the friends stayed behind very confused. They explained to the police that Karen had told them that this was her house, and that they were just gonna go swim in her new pool, and then head to the beach, so they would never go in the house. Later on, no charges are pressed, and I hope the Karen did learn her lesson. What an absolutely ridiculous story. Hey, fake it till you make it, right? And in this case, fake it until you get caught. That is just so embarrassing to think about. Guys, she literally walked up to some random person's front door, and try to unlock it with a key that she knew wouldn't work. If I was that Karen, I would totally ghost at that point. I'd be dead from embarrassment. What do you even say to your two friends after that? Oh, I lied. That's not my house. I was pretending. So the morning after a good rowdy kickback in our apartment, my roommate and I go to the orange hardware store after noticing some holes in the walls. My roommate goes to find plaster, and I go find paint. 
I get to the paint department and I'm looking through the paint swatches to remember what our walls look like. I then pick out a color that's probably the closest and if not, I can just mix my own paint since I'm an art miner. There is no employee at the paint mixing station so to kill some time before one comes along, I just put the swatch in my hoodie and then sort the paint swatches properly because mild OCD. And then it comes. I hear, ahem. I turn around to see Karen and she says, hey, I need you to do your job and mix me some paint. Now at this, I stare blankly at her as my hangover's blocking my ability to respond, and she says, Hello, I'm talking to you. Mix my paint. Fortunately, my brain decides to turn on again, and I say, Uh, I, I don't work. I then get cut off by Karen, and she says, I saw you sorting that color wall. Were you about to say that you don't work here? Only a lazy employee would say something like that to not help customers. I told her, ma'am, I'm gonna be honest, I'm really hungover, and your screeching is making me want to puke. Now that statement went as well as you would expect. Karen sighs and says, ugh, you've gotta be kidding me. You are such a terrible worker. Do I need to find a manager and have you fired? She then storms off, so once she left, I hear chuckling down the aisle behind me. Lo and behold, my roommate listened to most of it, and he's laughing his ass off. He asked if I got the paint and I explained the first part of the confrontation and told him I'm waiting on an employee to come back. We decide to wait for the manager because we know for sure she's going to be stomping back with one. Now, since my friend and I live for this kind of stuff, we think, hey, maybe he'll mix our paint before we're kicked out. So we wait a few more minutes and George, an employee, walks up, oblivious to what just transpired. We tell him what we need and he starts mixing our paint. A few minutes later, Karen arrives with the manager, and she says, That's him. That's the one that called me an orangutan whore. He's so disrespectful, he needs to be fired right now. Pointing at me. The manager then says, George? Wow, I'm frankly surprised you'd say such a nasty thing to a customer. At this, George says, Uh, what now? Karen then says, No, no, not him. The scrawny one in that hoodie. He even told me he's drunk. Now at this, the manager looks at me and he looks confused and says, Ma'am, he doesn't work here, but I can ask him to leave for insulting you. Karen then says, No, he definitely works here. I saw him working. He was sorting the color swatches. I then say to her, Okay, well, consider today my last day then. I quit. She says, You can't quit. I want you fired. By now, our paint's done mixing and I ask George if he'd like to escort us to the front. I've never seen a morning shift employee brighten up so fast. Karen's being belligerent, and the manager tries to calm her down with coupons. My roommates, George and I, leave paint as fast as possible, and I can still hear her screeching from the cashier stand. I explained what really happened, and he laughed, and he says he'll tell the manager the situation. Now initially, my roommate and I were gonna go straight home, but we had to see the outcome of this. We had time, so we showed George where we parked and where we were sitting, and he agreed to come back out once the orangutan whore was gone. The police ended up having to be called just to escort her out, but she wasn't arrested. Manager and George come out to the car, and as George had already explained what happened, the manager profusely apologized. We laughed it off, and I said something along the lines of, it was worth getting out of bed for this, despite the hangover. We were so kindly informed that Karen had come back later that day, and she had vandalized some of the yard equipment that's always on display, and she was arrested. Serves her right. My goodness, now Karen, my biggest question is why would you lie and insult yourself to that degree? Like she literally could have said anything else <laughs> since she was just making up baloney. She could have said that the employee called her a big fat tree stump. But no, she chose to go with orangutan whore. Like what a creative insult that was. So last fall, we moved into a new house and less than two weeks later, we had a baby. We were pretty focused on the whole parenting thing, and we failed to notice how often the neighbor on one side was using our property for several things, without any kind of permission or discussion. Now, it began when his kids spent their days on our driveway, drawing with sidewalk chalk. We had to ask them to stop because we seriously feared running them over when backing out of the garage, as they have absolutely no supervision or regard for cars. They then stopped drawing, and then they started using our garage door as a bumper stop while riding their scooters and bikes. They physically bashed into my garage door and they dented it. I asked them to stop, and after a dozen or so instances, they finally stopped. In the spring, we noticed the dad was parking his trailer on our side of the property between our two driveways. The property line is very clear, with fences and different types of landscaping. In addition, he was pulling his garbage cans through our gravel and making huge tracks. 
So, as we're in the middle of a pandemic and we have a baby, we decided to write a note and leave it with our information, while also lining the property line with huge rocks. We never did hear from them, but they had moved the rocks into a pile and put them on the front of our property. We then moved the rocks back again and thought we had made our position very clear. At the beginning of June, the dad comes and rings our doorbell. He proceeded to tell us that he's parked his trailer like that since he's moved in, and no one has cared before, and we can't care either. At no point did he ask if he could park on our side of the property or use our property. He said to me, it's never been a problem and I should be able to do it. We then politely said that we did not give him permission to do so and explained that we intended to landscape the area and his trailer and use of our property would ruin the landscaping that we planned. The entire conversation was so difficult because he spoke over me the entire time and he talked to me like a child. At the end of the confrontation, he said that we were rude neighbors and stormed off. Since then, he parks even further onto our side. He moves our landscaping rocks constantly, and he aggressively moves his garbage cans through our gravel, leaving marks like he was zigzagging back and forth. So this weekend, I started taking photos as proof of his parking, and the way he's ruined our gravel with his garbage cans. He then came out and glared at me, and I very nicely again asked him to stop. He replied, Why? And when I said it's because it's my property and we've asked him not to, he replied, Whatever, and walked away. Now we come to today, and I'm done. I'm so frustrated that this guy feels like he's entitled to unquestioned use of property that's not his. I drafted a cease and desist letter with some legal assistance. Prior to sending it, I wanted to ensure that I had proper cameras in the event that he decided to make things worse. When I installed the camera, the neighbor must have realized why it was installed because they stopped doing all the annoying stuff. Then about a month later, they listed their house for sale. They moved out, and we don't have to deal with their entitled attitude anymore. How entitled do you have to be to literally put your house up for sale and move away because you were told to stop using someone else's property? Like, wow. I do, however, feel bad for the new neighbors he's going to have, though. Like, living beside an entitled neighbor that has no respect for boundaries and personal property is the worst. And I seriously don't know how OP put up with that neighbor for as long as he did. Okay, so this story happened years ago, but I still remember it because I still can't understand my mom's logic behind it. My mom has always been a super entitled brat and the golden child of her family. Anyways, my birthday party rolls around and it was time to open presents. Me, being my anti-social self, just wanted to get this party over with and to be left alone. I opened presents from my favorite auntie. She had gotten me some books on witchcraft history and on the occult because she knew I was really into learning about that kind of stuff back then. I then got the normal presents I suppose from my uncles and aunties and also 20 bucks here and there. Once I was done with what was on the table, I said thank you to every single person. I was trying to escape back to the garage with my dad when I was stopped by my mom as I went to leave, saying that I didn't open the presents from her yet. I sigh, thinking she's bought me another really girly thing to wear. Now I want to note that she hates the way I dress because I normally wear a lot of black, and I still do actually. So I sit down on the couch and she hands me three boxes, one small box and two medium boxes. I unwrap the small one first, and lo and behold, she gets me a bottle of her favorite perfume. I then look at her like, what the F mom? And she says, oh, if you don't like it, I'll just keep it. I then unwrap the second present. It's new Nikes that are too big for me, but oh wait, wouldn't you know it? They're my mother's size. I then sigh and hand them over to her without a word. She then starts loudly saying, I've been meaning to get new gym shoes to the whole room. So at this, my best friend looks at me and she just rolls her eyes because she knows how my mother is. I then open the last present, and this one was actually really nice. It was a brand new Discman, and yes, I'm really old. It was really nice. It had a strap for your hand to slide in so you can walk with it comfortably. I said, cool, thanks mom. And at this, my mom looks annoyed. I start to walk away with my Discman in hand, and she gets up and tells me, oh, I bought that for you so we can both use it. I'm gonna need it for the gym later, so can you put that in my room? I told her, I'm sorry mom, but I already gave you back your things, but this is mine. Thank you for buying yourself presents and pretending they're for me. I then walk to the garage with my friend laughing quietly. I tell my dad all about my mom's attempt at presents, and he just sighs and hands me a beer. My mom then comes outside yelling at me how I could embarrass her like that in front of her friends. She just stomps her foot and then looks at my dad for help. And dad says, so you bought yourself presents for her 16th birthday. Did you think she would be happy about that? She has a right to be upset and you don't really have a leg to stand on here. My mom just huffed and she stomped back in the house. And I spent the rest of the party with my dad and my friend in the garage.
At least OP got to keep the discman, right? The mom just sounds over the top ridiculous though. Yeah. Let's just buy things that I want for my daughter's birthday. So OP did come into the comments and say that her parents were divorced and at the time she was living with dad. And I can see why. It seems like he's the cooler parent in this one. I used to work at the West Coast Division store of Kroger. My family has several pets and farm animals, so I routinely shop at the local farm store. So the staff are familiar with me. Most of the time, I did this after my shift ended, which means I'm in my work uniform which is black slacks and a button-up gray shirt that has the store logos on them. The farm store personnel wear jeans, t-shirts, and a gold color vest with a farm store logo. So there I was, in the store looking at some electric fence supplies, and this woman kept pestering me and asking me questions about some jeans she wanted to try on from the other side of the store. I politely pointed in that direction of the clothing section and she stomped off. A couple of minutes later, the same woman is demanding I unlock the changing room for her. I'm rather irritated with her over-aggressive Karen attitude, so I snapped, No, I don't work here, now go away and leave me alone. Again, the woman stomps off. I picked up a few items and start towards the checkout when I get ambushed by the same woman, who now has the store manager with her. The woman is demanding that I apologize to her, and the manager just shakes his head and asks, Would you like to apologize to this customer? I tell him, what for? She's rude, she's obnoxious, and irritating as hell. No, I don't want to apologize. The woman hears that and she screams, I have never been so humiliated in all my life. You need to fire him right now. At this point, the manager's still shaking his head in disbelief, and he says, well ma'am, I'm not able to do that. And she demands, and why the hell not? The manager tells her, I don't work here, and she's standing there not able to comprehend. The store manager is just standing there staring at her, and I reply, obviously she's not smart enough to figure out that I don't work here, so save us both some time and fire me. Then maybe she'll shut up and go away. The manager then says to me, you're fired, drawing in even more attention from the customers in the store. That's when I leaned in closer to the woman and say, are you happy now, ma'am? That's the third time he's fired me this week. Have a nice day. Thank you for shopping Smith's Food and Drug. I then walked away, and the manager hollers at me asking if he'll see me tomorrow, and I say, yep, I gotta get hay and alfalfa. Hearing that, the woman throws down the jeans she was holding, and she runs out the doors. All I can say is Opie didn't have to try hard to humiliate her guys, it seems like the woman did just fine by herself. So a little bit of backstory. My friend and I are extremely close, and we always go shopping when we can. It was after finals at school, and everybody else had plans, so we went to our town center by the school to eat lunch and shop because teenage boredom. We went to the normal kinds of clothes shops, such as H&M, Dillard's, Macy's, etc., to look and try out clothes that we picked out for each other. We were walking around, and she saw something she liked in some clothing store that we've never been to, so we went in and started looking at stuff. That's when she noticed the bra section, and she starts looking through it, seeing if she could find something that fits. While we were looking around, a girl and her mom walks in, Nothing special about them, so we paid them no mind. We kept looking around, and we kinda split up when the mother taps me on the shoulder, and she gives me the, come over here so we can talk in private wave. She then says to me, excuse me, is that your girlfriend? I told her, no no, we're just really good friends, is there something wrong? Karen then gestures to her daughter and says, well, you see, she's making my daughter feel very self-conscious. I then said, oh, did we say something inappropriate? I'm so sorry if we did. We'll make sure to watch what we're saying. At this, Karen says, no, no, it's nothing like that. It's just, she's so big there. It's making my daughter think that she needs a boob job like her. Now I'm thinking, excuse me? At this point, I'm already getting kinda mad since she assumed my friend got a boob job at the age of 17, but I let it slide since people do sometimes get the wrong impression. Karen then goes on and says, I was just wondering if you guys could leave so my daughter could shop in peace. I tell her, okay hold on, you want me and my friend to leave because my friend's chest is big? Are you serious? Karen then says, it's not that big of a deal, this store is not meant for people like her anyway, she needs to go to Hot Topic or something. Now, I'm basically about to lose it on this woman. I can handle a misjudged insult, but when you insult an entire person, that's when I get angry. So I tell the Karen, as far as we're concerned, this place is open to the public and we're allowed to shop here if we want. If your daughter can't deal with looking at my friend's figure, you need to reassure her that she's beautiful in her own way and to not worry about stuff like that not basically back her up that she should be self-conscious about herself. 
Now, I can then see the Karen getting frustrated at the fact that I'm making good arguments. At this point, we're starting to cause a ruckus in the store, and the manager comes over and says, Is there a problem here? Karen then says, Yes, this slut, pointing to my friend, is making my daughter feel so self-conscious about her body, and she refuses to leave. At this, the store manager says, Ma'am, anyone is allowed to shop in our store, but now you two aren't. I was surprised at how quickly the manager kicked them out, but I wasn't complaining. She was escorted out, and she was calling me and my friend insults while on her way out, with her daughter not even saying a word. The manager then apologized and told us to take our time. Guys, honestly, I think if anybody was making the daughter feel self-conscious, it's Karen, the mom, 100%. Like, the fact that she even said that to the manager is enough to make her teenage daughter probably want to crawl into a hole and never come out. I mean... Can you really blame her? I guess she was just trying to do what's best for her daughter, right? <laughs> this happened just this morning. My day started off with me showing up to work, only to realize that today was my day off. So with my day off, I decided to go and buy a turkey for Thanksgiving. I didn't go back home to change my clothes because the store was closer. So I went to the store in a typical office outfit, not thinking anything of it. There were plenty of turkeys, and I chose a nice big fat one, and I was salivating already. As I was about to put it into my cart, this older woman says, I'll take that one, and reaches for it. Now I thought that was some kind of joke she was making, like, that's a nice turkey, I'll take it, only to pretend to grab it. So I chuckle until she actually has her hands on the turkey and she tries to take it. I was shocked and asked what she's doing. She then becomes all huffy and whiny and said, I thought you were restocking the turkey, and since you were holding it, I felt it was better to grab it from you than to have to bend over and grab one, potentially hurting my back. At this point, I'm a little confused, so I say, restock it? Oh, I don't work here. I was just putting the turkey into the cart, not taking the turkey out of it. Hearing this, Karen got really upset, and she grabs her husband's attention. Now, this guy looks like one of those my wife is a queen and should be treated as such types. He looks at me like I'm some sort of idiot who needs to be told how to respect people even though I'm pushing 30. He says to me, son, now you give her that turkey and maybe I won't report you to your manager. I just look at him and say, I'm sorry, I don't actually work here, there's plenty of other turkeys right there. I mean, if she needs help putting a turkey into her cards, I don't mind helping, but you seem like you're more than capable of doing that. Hearing this, he then raises his voice at me and said, I tried to be fair with you. Now you give her that turkey on the count of three, or I will have no choice but to put the fear of God into you. At this, I stare at him blankly, wondering if this is real, and then the guy starts to count. He starts counting out loudly, saying, one, two, and at this point, I'm pretty much just going, what the heck is wrong with this guy? Is he for real? I just want this turkey. There's plenty of other turkeys. Why is this one so special? So thankfully, the meat department manager was close by, and he interrupts him, saying, is everything all right over here? The man looks at him and says, no, your employee over here is refusing to give my wife that turkey. She has a bad back, and trying to lift one of these turkeys could cause her harm. I should sue you and this idiot you hired for attempting to cause my wife bodily harm. The manager then looks at me, seeing that I clearly do not work here, and said to him, Sir, this man doesn't work here. He has no obligation to give you that turkey. Please calm down, and I'll grab another turkey for you. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Hearing that, the man's face turns red, and he loses it. He says, I'm a customer. How dare you talk to me in such disrespect? I will have you know that this is no man. This is a boy who needs to be taught a lesson in manners, and if you don't understand that, maybe you need a lesson too. His wife then looks at me like a teacher would look at a misbehaving student and said, See what you caused? Your mother must have been a horrible parent if this is the child she raised. And I'm thinking, oh no, 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 no. You're not gonna talk about my mom. So I say to her, you know what? Here, take it. Take this stupid turkey, have it. It's not worth putting up with this Jerry Springer act, so have your damn turkey. I then slam it into their cart and stormed out. Now, I thought I'd be done with them, but Mr. Anger Management decides that I did not excuse myself from the dinner table properly enough. He says, Excuse you? I demand an apology for how you're treating my wife and I, and I want it right now. So, I give it to him. I flip him off. I tell him he can shove it where the sun don't shine, along with that turkey, and then I let him know that my mom died a few weeks ago, and I told him to thank his wife for what she said. Now, I've never been punched in the face before, and I can mark that off my bucket list, so yeah. When the cops asked if I wanted to press charges against him, you can bet your ass I did. 
The store manager gave me a free turkey, as well as several pies. Thanksgiving turned out great. As for the raging couple, I have a friend whose brother's a lawyer, and he'll be working on my case. I hope OP seriously went through with those charges on that guy. Like, hitting someone over a turkey is so ridiculous. And I feel like a lot of the people in these stories have an unbelievable sense of pride. Once someone's decided that they're right, pride doesn't allow them to shift their way of thinking. Like, that guy could have easily saw all the other turkeys there and grabbed one and called it a day. But no, he had to teach OP a lesson by assaulting him. Okay, so I used to work at a bar, as the only female security. Now, this bar had some very bad things happen when a man followed a woman to the bathroom, so they needed a woman who could keep an eye out on what happened in there. The bar also got in legal trouble all the time. The bathroom thing above, the fire marshal closing them down on some busy weekend nights for being over capacity, and the liquor board had pulled their license once already for over-serving or serving minors with pretty obvious fake IDs. I was one of the new security hired to help resolve all this. It was so bad that we had to be trained by a government ATF person and get a card to prove that we knew how to spot and stop over serves, and also to spot fake IDs. But I think the real reason they hired us was to have scapegoats on the ready for the next time they did this. So I worked there for a while, and I was doing my best. But the owner's wife was the worst. The woman was always drunk, always had her friends in the bar, and bent the rules for them. She thought she was Lady Jesus and that we should all be kissing her feet because she was the owner's wife. I mostly stayed out of her way and had no issues, but many co-workers complained about her. On one night, some dude gets sick on the way to the bathroom and I cut him off and he ends up getting escorted out by his less drunk friends. I then notice a man sitting at the bar watching this. The guy was wearing creased slacks, a jacket indoors on a summer night, and had no drink in his hand. I start watching him and notice the badge under his jacket, and I'm thinking, aha, uh -huh. the guy's here to watch for over-serving. So a little while later, a woman comes to the bathroom, drunk enough to need to hold onto the walls for dear life. I cut her off. The woman then screams at me and goes into the bathroom and tries to wash off the giant black Sharpie X from the back of her hands. I warn her that she'll be kicked out of the club if she continues. The woman screams again and staggers out of the bathroom. About five minutes later, the owner's wife is in my face and she's screaming. So apparently the woman I cut off was one of her best friends, attending a bachelorette party in the VIP section. And she screamed at me that I was supposed to somehow magically know that the woman was VIP. I was also apparently supposed to break the law for her because she was VIP. So her and I start a screaming match, where I inform her that her husband had hired me to make sure the law was followed. I also start to inform her about the police officer sitting at the bar, but she screamed in my face to shut your damn mouth and get out of my bar. The woman fired me on the spot. So I decide, you know what, I'll just go. I didn't bother waiting to see if her husband agreed. It was known that she wore the pants. I complied, shut my mouth, and got out of her bar. I walked past the cop, still sitting at the end of the bar near the bathrooms, where the screaming match had taken place. I made eye contact with him, gave a slight nod, to which he responded by looking at the boss's wife, rolling his eyes, and smiling at me as I laughed. They got shut down almost immediately that night, for over-serving the bachelorette party. And this time they actually went out of business because of too many strikes against them. Guys, can I just say how much I enjoyed that the undercover cop was there and got to witness the BS the owner's wife pulled? And I only wish Opie stayed there for the fallout where the officer confronted the wife so we could all know what happened. Like, I'm just going to imagine her going mega Karen, screaming and attack the officer, and in the end getting arrested. And guys, I bet the husband was really happy about his wife's entitlement, getting his business shut down for good though. So, some short backstory. I suffer from social anxiety, and the key element to the story is I hate when strangers touch me. Like, I get really uncomfortable and freaked out by it. That and the fact that I did take a couple of self-defense classes a couple of years ago. Not too much, but enough to know how to strike a punch. So this story happens in the local go-to discount store. The dress code is a blue polo with the store's logo in big yellow font on the back, and a small logo on the front. It shouldn't be hard to spot when someone's an employee. I was there wearing a classic white t-shirt at the time, not remotely any hue of blue, and no bright yellow name tag on. Anyway, I was casually browsing the store, putting stuff in the cart I was carrying with me. At some point, I decide I really don't want this random item, so naturally, I go put it back because I'm a decent human being that doesn't leave stuff laying randomly. And in comes Karen charging at me. She proceeds to snap her fingers and say something along the lines of, Hey, you, come over here. 
Now, like so many others on this post, I do ignore her, thinking that she's not talking to me because why would she? I'm not an employee. Well, it turns out she didn't like this. At one point, I walk away from her, towards the registers, to pay for my goods. As I'm walking away, the woman proceeds to walk up behind me, grab me by the shoulder, and yell something like, how dare you, blah blah blah. And she spun me around. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not a touchy-touchy person, and I'm not saying what she did is necessarily okay, but I acted on pure instinct from what I learned in self-defense. Mid-spin around, I yell, back off as loud as I can, and proceeded to give a mixture of a shove and a punch. Now, the result of the punch was Karen falling flat on her ass and proceeded to yell even more obscure things. Karen says, You idiot! Did you just punch a paying customer? Are you trying to get fired? I'm getting a manager right now, and I'll have you fired and arrested. Now, luckily a manager was nearby, and I guess he heard the shouting because he came rushing over saying, What's going on here? Karen says, Listen, Your stupid employee just ignored me, and then he proceeded to assault me completely unprovoked. I demand you fire him and call the police. At that I say, lady, I told you I don't work here. You assaulted me. Of course I'm going to defend myself. The manager tells her, this man doesn't work here. She says, then why was he putting things back on the shelves? It doesn't matter anyway. You need to call the police. The manager says, I'd be happy to call police for you. I'm sure they'll be here soon. I say to him, look man, I just want to buy my stuff and go home. Karen screams, you are not going anywhere. You punched me. That's assault. You're lucky I'm calling police instead of beating you right here. Now the manager did end up calling police and we stuck around. Two nice gentlemen in uniforms were with us within 10 minutes asking what happened. Karen proceeds to give a sob story about how she was a poor old woman just looking for something and politely asked me, but I ignored her. And when she asked me again, that resulted in me getting upset and punching her, and even kicking her when she was down. I then tell my story, and the whole time she keeps screaming how I'm a filthy liar, and she's a poor victim because she's a woman and all sorts of crap. Out of nowhere, the manager tells us that he can put a stop to this he-said-she-said debacle, and he tells us that he can quickly pull up the footage from the CCTV, and the police were more than eager to see it. One of the officers goes with him while the other stayed with us. A few minutes later, the officer comes out saying, Well, lady, it looks like you assaulted him, and he simply defended himself. I also don't spot him either punching or kicking you when you were down, so I don't know what you were talking about. This results in arguing that becomes one giant mess of a discussion between her and the officers. It ends with her lunging at one of the officers, and it looks like she was going to slap him or something, and she was taken back to the station with them. Apparently attempting to assault an officer isn't very popular with the said officer. Now I have no clue what happened to her, but I was free to go, and I got a free coupon for approximately $35. I saw the manager a couple of times in the store afterward, and apparently the crazy woman has been banned from the store, and he hasn't heard anything new either. Yeah, that's a great idea, Karen. Let's just lunge at an officer and try to attack him when he didn't believe your little sob story. Reading these stories about people getting mistaken as employees by just putting things back on the shelves makes me really want to go to Walmart and try it out for myself. Like, how many items can I put back onto the shelf before someone asks if I work there? This story takes place at a local coffee shop. This happened when my daughter was about four months. One afternoon, after our mommy and me yoga class, me and baby decided to get a coffee and catch up. Well, I would get coffee. She would get that sweet, sweet booby milk. Well, baby being the lightweight she is, she passes out after the boob milk. I decide to be wild and get that second cup of coffee. So as I'm drinking my second cup of coffee, a wild Karen walks in with her daughter, who looked to be about five years old. And immediately, I hear the daughter say, Aw, a baby. At that, I smile, but I go back to reading the news and sipping my coffee, when out of nowhere, the daughter rushes over to try to pick up my sleeping baby. I panicked, obviously. I started yelling, no, 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 no. And Karen comes in and says, oh, she wasn't hurting her. At this, her daughter yells, Mommy, I want to hold the baby. I tell her she's sleeping, and you're too little to hold her, honey. She's heavy. Karen hears me say this, and she says, Oh, just let her hold her. My daughter may look small, but she's very mature. I told her, No, she's not a baby doll. You can't. At this, Karen replies, You don't have to be a bitch. Excuse me? Now, during this time, her daughter did try to pick up my baby and woke her up. Baby starts crying, so I pick her up and start hushing her. I say to them, see what you did, leave us alone. Karen then says, she just wants my daughter to hold her. 
Here. She then reaches out and tries to grab my baby, and I scream, Get away from us! Just let her hold her! Now the woman keeps her arms out in hopes that I'll pass my baby to her, and she's literally trying to steal my baby. I then say help and swat at her face with my free hand. At this point, the coffee shop employees jump in and pull her away. One of them says that they called the police. The mother's nose is bleeding, the kid is sobbing, and I kind of feel bad for the kid. She's pretty little, but her mom should teach her better. The employees then ask us to stay and wait for police, while the woman's screaming that I just assaulted her and traumatized her child. My baby's still crying, so I give her a boob to calm her down, and that's when Karen screams, EW! She's exposing herself in public! My child is right here, you pedo! I ignore her, and baby finally calms down, and the police come, and they ask us each what happened. The woman screams that I exposed myself to her daughter, and then assaulted her. Now, at this point, I'm scared that I'm gonna go to jail, and I do regret hitting her in the face. I tell the officer, that's not true. She tried to steal my baby. I was just protecting her. Luckily, the coffee place did have cameras. The police took a look and clearly saw me hitting her as self-defense. The woman gets arrested for attempted kidnapping. I have to go to court for it next month. So, a little update. We go to court on April 14th for the criminal charges against the mom for attempted kidnapping. Now, I didn't expect to update before then, but then this happened. So me and baby went to the park this morning and we got back around 11 a.m. There was a man standing on our porch looking lost and baby was in her stroller sleeping. I asked the man, can I help you? The man says he's looking for first name, last name, as I have a package for her. He then pulls out a thick envelope and I say, I'm her, I can take it. So I then find out he's a legal intern. The guy lets me know that the woman's suing me. Yep, that's right, I'm being sued by Karen. Now, why would the woman who tried to snatch my baby be suing me? And how much damage could I have inflicted? Well, apparently I did $25,000 in damage. In this poor envelope was about 10 million pages detailing how she's suing me for everything that's wrong in her life. Apparently I had broken her nose, so she's suing me for not only the related medical bills, but she also wants me to pay for them to fix her pre-existing toad nose. And of course, she's suing me for emotional damages to her and her child. Apparently Karen's now suffering from anxiety and depression because of me. Finally, I'm also being sued for slander and character assassination, which in layman's terms is ruining her reputation because how dare I say she tried to steal my baby. And of course, at the end, she said she'd be willing to settle out of court if I would drop the criminal charges. Well, with that, I took the letter to my lawyer, and he said the judge would laugh her out of court, especially if the criminal trial does go in our favor, which is basically guaranteed. So I will be seeing her in court on April 14th, and I'll see her again in July for the civil case. Guys, that's absolutely wild. Leave it up to an entitled Karen to twist things around to make OP look like the bad guy in this situation, right? Like, what the heck was she thinking? How dare that mom defend herself against me trying to grab her newborn out of her arms? I'm gonna sue the crap out of her. Now, of course, OP has this juicy part two right here, guys, and it's freaking amazing. Firstly, thanks to everybody for the support and love. I can't wait to tell baby all about this when she gets older. Wednesday, we found out the verdict on the entitled mom, the Karen. So this chapter opens up on April 15th, 2019, approximately 9.30 a.m. We were at the local courthouse. Me and Mr. had dropped off baby at his mother's. Now I had considered bringing her and breastfeeding while the mom was on the stand just to irritate her, but I didn't think an 8 month old would be able to sit quietly for that long. Instead, I brought my 384 month old husband. So we went to the courthouse and I'll admit that I was nervous. We took our seats behind the prosecutor and we were just chatting with her. Karen then enters with her lawyer and if looks could kill, I would be dead. Then the judge and jury enter and we're ready to get started. Now, disclaimer, these were three very long, very stressful days so I will be paraphrasing a lot. The judge looks at Karen and says, Ma'am, you are charged with attempted kidnapping, first degree assault, disturbing the peace, and disorderly conduct. How do you plead? At this, Karen says, Your Honor, I'm 100% innocent. In fact, I'm outraged that I stand accused of wrongdoing. I'm a proud American and the biggest supporter of these proud, fair, and just... The judge interrupts her, looking already done with her and says, Please sit down, now. At that, the mom sits and the judge says, We will now proceed to opening statements. Prosecutor? The prosecutor lays out the case, explaining that the Karen was a dangerous woman who attempted to rip a small baby from its mother's arms. With this, Karen screams, No, 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 that's not true. The judge then looks to the lawyer and says, Hey, 
tell her to be quiet. Prosecutor continues and says, there is clear indisputable evidence that this woman is guilty on all counts. The prosecutor wraps up his opening statement in under five minutes, explaining that the whole situation was caught on tape and that the evidence will speak for itself. The defense's opening statement was about 40 minutes long. He pretty much gave this woman's whole life story, how she couldn't possibly be guilty. How she was your typical suburban soccer mom, president of the HOA, active in her church, blah blah blah. Now apparently because the statements established character, they weren't off topic enough to make the judge tell her lawyer to shut up and sit down. The lawyer talked so long that after they concluded, the judge dismissed us for the day. So we come back the second day, and before the trial starts, my husband goes and grabs us a cup of caffeine from the booth in the courthouse. He's putting his cream and sugar in it when I guess her husband approaches. The guy says to him, hey man, how you doing? My husband says fine. The guy says, this whole mess is crazy, right? Look man, what's gonna happen to my daughter if her mom goes to jail? It's not good for the kid. My husband tells him, yeah, that's rough, sorry. The guy then says to my husband, well, could you tell your wife to just drop the charges? You know, do what's best for the kids? At this, my husband says, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. He then says, come on, man, be reasonable. To which my husband says, if your wife was reasonable, we wouldn't even be here. So the second day of court starts. The prosecution lays out the evidence, including the tape, calls witnesses, and all that prosecution stuff. When the prosecution calls witnesses, the defense also gets to ask them questions. They were trying to cast doubt on all the witnesses, I guess to make it seem like it was all a witch hunt against the entitled mom. Finally, it was my turn to testify, and be questioned. I told this story for the prosecution, and then this foolishness ensued. Karen's lawyer says to me, so, it seems that you were the first one to raise your voice. Would you say this is accurate? I tell him, I suppose so. So, that would make you the instigator. I tell him, I don't think... He then cuts me off and says, You claimed that this woman assaulted you. Yes. Did she strike you at any point during this altercation? I then say to him, well, not exactly strike. He says, did you strike her at any point? Yes, but that was too... He then stops me and says, The jury will notice that this woman has admitted to not only being the instigator, but also the aggressor in this situation. After the prosecution lays out their evidence, it's the defense's turn. It's at this point Karen takes the stand, and she twisted her version of events. So, according to her, her daughter had seen my baby, and had approached me to tell me how beautiful the baby was. Now, in response to this totally innocent interaction, I apparently began verbally abusing her daughter. Karen says how she attempted to calm me, but this backfired. Apparently, when I violently snatched up the baby, she couldn't help but notice that it was very unlikely that the baby was mine. She saw an unstable woman, snatching up an innocent, probably kidnapped baby, and she just had to intervene. When she did, I viciously attacked her and broke her nose. That was her story. So day three is the verdict and sentencing. On the charge of attempted kidnapping, the jury decided that there was not enough evidence to conclude that she wanted to kidnap my baby, so not guilty. On the charge of assault, the jury was not convinced by her lawyer's attempts to demonize me. Guilty. On disturbing the peace and disorderly conduct, the tapes and witnesses led to a guilty verdict. Now we get to the part where you've all been waiting for. The sentencing. So, the woman was sentenced to 18 months of probation, 40 hours of community service, 30 hours of anger management, and $730 in fines. This all goes on her criminal record, and if she violates her probation, or doesn't do what's required, she will spend those 18 months in prison. Now, while I know many of us were hoping for jail time, I'm pretty satisfied with this outcome, and I think it's fair. We left feeling pretty good, and we have to go back to court in a few months for the civil case. So there you have it, guys. The moral of the story is, don't try to grab people's babies. Because you might end up getting punched in the nose and end up in court. <laughs> guys, OP had every right to go mama bear mode and defend her daughter from this crazy woman who wouldn't back down from trying to grab at her kid. And that's a terrifying situation to be in for the mother. Alright. So many years ago, I was exploring Walmart looking for good deals on unnecessary necessities when I was confronted by a sweet, nice woman of about 30-ish years old. Before she approached, I was looking in the tool slash car section, looking for a better impact and some nice floor mats for my truck. The woman approaches with a cheery, yoo-hoo, I need some help. 
and I immediately realized that I made a mistake in my wardrobe today. You see, I like to wear vests, and today, I was wearing my blue one. Mind you, it was a light blue, akin to the blue worn by Walmart employees, but it had sparkly swirls all over it. And tassels. Don't ask. Well, I decided to be nice and to help the lady out, as it wouldn't hurt to help out. Or, so I thought. So I said, yes, how can I help? And she said she needed a video game out of the cabinet, and could I please get it for her? I then gave a little chuckle, as I tried to explain that I thought she needed help with something heavy, or up high, or locating something, as I don't actually work here, so I don't have the keys to those cabinets. During my whole explanation, the sweetness in her face slowly got replaced with anger. She then screamed how I'm wearing the blue vest and how I do look like I work here and how dare I lie to her face and that she's gonna get me fired. The whole time I was trying to calm her down and explain that I really don't work here, it was just a fancy vest. She ended up getting fed up with me telling horrible lies to an innocent woman just trying to get a present for her son. She then raised her open hand and pulls it all the way back as if she wanted to slap me. Now in that moment, three thoughts crossed my mind. First, am I about to knock this birch tree's teeth in? Second, I don't remember seeing any cameras in this aisle, and most people would take the pretty woman's word over the large, odd-dressed man's. And third, fake it and go with the slap. Well, I went with the slap, but boy did that woman pack a slap. A little too much, because my head smashes into a shelf. And as I look up from the floor, through the blood flowing over my face, I hear, oh my god and saw another woman who had heard the screams rushing over. I then looked at my attacker and saw the fear in her eyes. Now, the look wasn't shame, it wasn't shock, not even feeling bad for attacking anyone. All I saw was fear of her consequences in her eyes. The Karen then tried to run, and that's when the witness yelled out for her to stop, and that's when I grabbed her ankle and she fell and slammed her face on the floor. I later found out that she lost her two front teeth, and I really did feel bad for hurting her, but she couldn't get away. Later, after statements and the first aid treatment, I got to watch my attacker get put into a police car while screaming all kinds of threats and obscenities at me. It was nice. Now, I don't know if she got jail time, though. I never heard anything after that. Guys, it is absolutely bonkers how quickly people can go from 0 to 100. Like, from, hey, can you help me with this, to downright trying to slap a stranger in a freaking store. Like guys, I really don't know what makes people act like this. Like, is it entitlement? Some of you have mentioned mental disorders. Some have mentioned Karens having anger issues. How the heck can some people never go, oh, you don't work here? Let me go find someone else. So, some background. I live in a rather quiet apartment building. But as soon as this crazy bitch moved here, I knew that my situation was about to get crazy. So, I always try my best to be kind to my neighbors, and it wasn't any different for this woman. I enjoy having some small get-togethers in my apartment with a couple of my neighbors. So when she and her annoying kid moved into the building, I decided to invite them to a weekly Friday adults-only game night. Don't judge, this was all pre-COVID. So the party was set to begin at 7 o'clock, but Karen comes a good hour late. Our parties are only adults, because we have a lot of alcoholic beverages and we do have some weed set out. The mom decides to ignore the clear as day rule that kids aren't allowed, and she decides to bring her little kid to my house. As soon as I see the kid, I tell her no kids allowed, but then she goes and says, it's okay, he has my permission. Now hearing that, I do sigh, and I ask her to come back in 10 minutes. Me and the neighbors have to clear all the weed and alcohol and pack them into the cupboards. She and her son come back 30 minutes later, and they immediately start eating all of my food. This isn't even the real story yet. It's just some background to explain the fun that's about to happen. So, COVID happens, and my girlfriend was staying at my place because her parents both have pre-existing conditions. We went through the whole process, quarantine, testing, and eventual moving. So one day, I was out of the house getting groceries when my girlfriend calls me crying, saying she doesn't feel safe in our apartment. Apparently my girlfriend was taking a shower when she heard someone moaning. She thought it was me, and she opens the curtain to see Karen's kid, that little creep, touching himself, and standing outside the open bathroom door. She screams, slapped him, and kicked him out. Hearing this, I immediately rushed home to comfort her, having absolutely no clue how that little bastard got into my home. As soon as I get home, I see the mom standing outside my apartment, banging on the door. I tap her on the shoulder and start to explain to her that she really needs to control her kid. 
I tried to be as nice as possible, even though I was seething with anger. I tried to tell her that I do understand that his body is going through changes and that he has urges, but breaking into people's houses and doing things like this wasn't okay at all, and I was gonna call the cops. Now, before I can finish, Karen goes off on me. She starts screaming that her son didn't break into anybody's house, and that my girlfriend had no right to hit him. She said she was gonna call the cops on us and tell them that we assaulted her boy. Even though at this point, I'm literally about to slap her, I try my best to remain calm and ask her how this mistake of a son got into my house. The woman starts screaming at me, and in her anger, she lets it slip that during my neighborly meeting where everybody was over and busy, she took one of my apartment keys, and my brain just shuts off. My girlfriend comes out hearing the commotion, and apparently, she heard that Karen stole my keys. My girlfriend goes off says she's calling the cops for stealing, breaking and entering, and invasion of privacy. At that point, my brain's still processing what she had just said. Now, the ridiculous thing is that she screams back that in her rental agreement, she was given access to all the amenities of the apartment, and she somehow believed that my apartment belonged to that too. Keep in mind, I own my apartment. Girlfriend and I kept strong on her promise, and we did call the cops on them right then and there. The woman got arrested, but I don't know what happened from there. All I know is that I changed my locks, got two new house keys, gave one to my girlfriend, and I kept one. And then I bought one of those camera doorbell things. (laughs) Yeah, I don't even know what to say to this. Like, she does deserve to be arrested and charged for sure. Like, I can't believe she stole Opie's set of house keys, and then she argued that she did nothing wrong. Like, I want to say that it was an excuse for getting caught. But I'm starting to think that some people are just really, really dumb, and she actually thought it was a part of her amenities. But hey, that's just me giving her the benefit of the doubt. And as for her creepy kid that just broke into Opie's house while his girlfriend was showering and started pleasuring himself, like, there's gotta be a crime in that, right? Like, how come that kid wasn't taken away? Okay, so this happened a couple of days ago, and the more I think of it, the more disturbed I get. So for some backstory, I'm a huge musical theater nerd. And a few years ago, I got to see Phantom of the Opera in Seattle. And as a souvenir, I bought a tote bag with the play's logo printed all over it that I'm still very fond of. Now the show is playing in a theater in my area, and there's been a lot of local buzz about it. I went to see it this weekend and decided to carry my Phantom tote bag for a while, since my love of the show has been bolstered. And the bag is a great conversation starter for the other theater nerds. Now let's set the stage. A couple of days ago, I go to the grocery store near my apartment to stock up on some pretty standard foodstuffs. When I walk in, I see a cashier I'm friendly with working the self-checkout kiosk, so I stop to talk to him for a few minutes. My bag was hanging over my shoulder within clear view of the doors. After a couple of minutes into my chat, I feel a tap on my shoulder. So I turn around to address whoever was trying to get my attention and found a relatively normal looking woman. Nothing to indicate that this woman was a Karen type in any way. She then says to me, Hey, is that the Phantom of the Opera on your bag? Now me, happy to chat about one of my favorite musicals, say, Yes it is. Do you like the show? That's when the Karen says, It's fine. I took my daughter last weekend to see it at the local theater. She loves musicals. I say to her, me too, I thought it was a really great show, the cast did a really great job, and she then cuts me off and says, did you buy that bag there, because I didn't see that bag at any of the booths. I tell her, actually, I got this in Seattle when I saw the show a few years ago. Karen then says, oh, because there really weren't any souvenirs at the show that my daughter liked, and she would love that bag. She then looks at me expectantly, and I realized what she wants and say, I'm sorry your daughter didn't find any keepsakes she wanted. The woman goes on and says, she was so disappointed that she didn't have anything to remember the show by. She would love your bag. Love it. I then say to her, well, I know I love this bag. I hope the next time your daughter sees a show, she finds a souvenir that she likes. Now, I'm pretty nervous at this point because I'm very non-confrontational, and I've read plenty of stories in this subreddit to know that people like causing scenes. I then grab my bag very tightly, trying to hold it against my body with my elbow, with both hands tightly on the straps. I then tell her, I've got to do my shopping now, so excuse me. To my pleasant surprise, she didn't really say anything, so I really thought I'd gotten away without anything crazy happening. 
I then grab the basket and go to the cereal aisle. As I'm putting Cheerios into my basket, the woman enters the aisle. Now she doesn't have a cart or a basket, and she doesn't try to approach me again. Instead, she just stares at me. I decide to try to ignore her and go about business as usual, grabbing things on my shopping list. Every aisle I go to, she follows me into. Every. Single. Aisle. And she's just staring at me. Now I'm certain she was just waiting for me to let my guard down. I then go through self-checkout, and she hangs by the discount bread rack, still watching. Now, knowing she's probably not gonna give this up when I leave the store, I flag down my acquaintance working the self-checkout, and tell him that I'm pretty sure this woman's gonna follow me to my car. He's wary of her, and he walks me and my purchase out to the parking lot, and doesn't leave until my bags are loaded, and I'm in my car with my doors locked. I was still keeping an eye on the woman, and sure enough, she left the store when I did, watching me as I got into my car. I then see her get into her own car, still watching me. My acquaintance who walked me out went back into the store, and I was left alone in my vehicle, caught in an awkward staring match with a Karen, who's also in her car. The woman didn't try to hide the fact that she was watching me. It then dawned on me that she was likely to follow me home. So instead of taking my usual exit that would take me back to my apartment, I drove over the next exit that turned off onto a major street. The Karen followed me like I expected, and I sat there for a couple of more minutes, just waiting. See, there's an intersection at the corner of the grocery store with really long light times, so cars end up lining up a fair amount. I wait until the last possible second until that light turned green and unleashed a wave of cars, turning right just before they hit, leaving the woman stranded to wait for them to pass if she wanted to follow me. I then drove up the street and got on the highway, then took the exit for the next neighborhood over and took the back way to my apartment. My car is pretty noticeable, it's bright orange, and I didn't want to take any chances that the woman may recognize my car by going back the way I came. It seems I successfully ditched her because no one's come banging on my door demanding that I give them my phantom tote. Needless to say, I'll be leaving that bag at home from now on. Guys, what a crazy situation that is. And that woman definitely would have followed OP to her house 100% because some people are just too darn entitled. And if you mix that with a little bit of crazy like that woman might have been, you've got a recipe for a potential disaster. And I'm just glad OP's okay and her bag is okay. Okay, so this happened last summer here in Australia, and I've recently found the police report again, which prompted me to share this story. Mid-January over in Australia is the dead of summer. It can easily get to 40 degrees Celsius outside, and that's 104 Fahrenheit. I was doing my shopping. Well, I was about to, when I passed a car in the parking lot that caught my eye. Now, the car was a standard-looking sedan, but what actually caught my eye was two kids sitting in the back seat, and one of them had a nosebleed that was gushing out. I called triple zero, which is Australia's 911, and immediately asked for police. I then told them very quickly what's going on and then asked for permission to break the window, while already taking my shirt off to protect my fist. Now they actually said no, because that's damage of property. I said I'm doing it anyway, because the longer I wait, the higher the chance that lives would be at risk. I think it finally clicked and they clued into what was going on, and said ambulance and cops were on the way. I told the kids to at least close their eyes and try to shield themselves in any way they could, and then BAM! Down goes the window. I had attracted a small crowd at this point from my yelling into the phone, but for the most part, I was ignoring them. I opened the doors, and a nice couple had helped me get the kids out and into the air conditioning of the shopping center. So long story short, yes, the cops arrived, and the entitled mother of the kids found her severely dehydrated children on the floor unconscious, and she starts swearing up a storm, demanding to know who had done this to her precious babies. I told her, you did this, you idiot, and then I put my shirt back on. And yes, when she found out who smashed her window, she tried to have me arrested, charged, and sued. She kept yelling at me that I'm gonna pay for the damages to her car. The cop, who's a father of two girls I later found out, had torn her a brand new one to shove those claims into. I was half-heartedly warned not to break windows again, but I was unofficially thanked by police. Okay, I just want to say good on OP for acting so quick and saving those kids' lives. Like, stories like this make me so angry, guys. And the fact that the woman had the audacity to try to have OP arrested, charged, and sued for breaking her window. Like, are you guys shaking your heads as hard as I am? Because the alternative is way, way worse, lady. Okay, so speaking of hot cars, check this news article out that I read not too long ago. The headline is, Woman complains patrol car is too hot during her arrest for leaving a child in a hot car. 
<laughs> like some freaking people, right? I, I don't even know what to say about this. Okay, so this story is about my sister-in-law and her useless boyfriend. My sister-in-law is my wife's sister. She's a terrific person. Her boyfriend is decidedly not. When it comes to being entitled, he's the gift that keeps on giving. Like chlamydia. In April of 2020, they lost their jobs due to COVID and they moved in with us rent-free until they could get back on their feet. We're happy to have sister-in-law. She's been absolutely terrific. She's been pitching around the house, spending time with family, and being my wife's best friend. This is decidedly not true of her boyfriend. The guy just locks himself in the room playing video games all day long. The guy complains about the food, and only recently he agreed to chip in for high-speed internet, which he kept demanding that we pay for, so his online games don't lag and otherwise makes it clear how much of an imposition it is for him to live in our home rent-free. So sister-in-law was finally able to get a full-time job last month. Their finances are still a mess, but things are improving, and she said they move out in the spring. Honestly, we're gonna miss her, but her boyfriend, the best I can say is I don't care if the door hits him on the way out or not, just as long as he's on the other side of it. Our oldest son is 23 years old. He moved about 30 minutes away back in the fall of 2019, so he could be close to his work. Thankfully, he's remained full-time, despite everything going on. In the fall of 2020, he renewed his lease for another year, in a nice but small studio apartment. Recently, a fantastic job opportunity arose for our son. He's moving much further away, which is sad, but it's a great opportunity, and we're happy for him. The largest problem for him is his lease, which still has 10 months to go. He spoke with his landlord, who's a good guy. He agreed that he would let our son out of the lease the moment he could rent the apartment to someone else. But the market's been really slow, and he doesn't know how long it would take. I don't blame the landlord a bit. He's being fair. Looking to get out of the lease sooner, our son suggested that sister-in-law and her boyfriend move in. He would move out February 1st, but he would pay for February and March. They would pick up the rent in April. This would give them two more months to get their finances in order, and he'd only be out two months' rent. And as an added bonus, it is closer to sister-in-law's job, and would cut 10 minutes off her daily commute. Everybody's happy, right? Everybody except for her boyfriend, that is. Looking at the apartment, he complained it was too small. He also complained that they would have to pay for food and utilities. You know, the things that he enjoys for free, because my wife and I are paying now. He also complained that he would have to set up his computer in the living room instead of the bedroom. Then he dropped this little nugget. He said, With utilities, it's going to be higher. You should pay all of our rent for the rest of the year, since we're doing you a favor. Now my son assumed that he misheard him and he restated his offer, that he'd pay for February and March rent, meaning that they would get two months rent free in the apartment, and then they'd take over payments in April. But no, that's not good enough. To boyfriend's way of thinking, our son should pay the rent for the remainder of the lease, which is 10 months, and let them live there rent free. Sister-in-law was mortified at her boyfriend for trying to take advantage of our son that way. After months and months of listening to him complain about his suffering while others paid for everything, she finally had enough. She said, Hey, I really like this place, so I'm moving in, but you're not. When we get home, you're packing your stuff up, and I'm driving you to your mother's. No more free rides. We're done. Our son then called with the happy news, on multiple fronts, while they drove home. Instead of 30 minutes, they took an hour to get home, and we were a little concerned. We called, and she confirmed everything was okay. So we assembled the moving boxes for him so he could start packing right away. Why postpone the party? He walked in the door to find everything he needed packed up. Apparently on their ride back, the boyfriend was whining and complaining about their breakup. They stopped to talk for a bit, at which point he said something that creeped her out, and then she asked me to drive him to his mother's, which I was more than pleased to do. We drove about an hour to his mother's place without speaking. I then helped him carry his stuff on the porch, and out of politeness, I extended him my hand and wished him luck. He stared at me and didn't say a word. There was no, hey, thanks for letting me live with you rent-free for almost a year, or tell sister-in-law I'm sorry. He just stared at me like the petulant child he is. So my sister-in-law is doing really well. We're gonna miss her moving away, and especially our son moving quite a distance away. But useless entitled boyfriend, we'll miss him about as much as last week's recycling. At least the recycling can be turned into something useful. 
Ouch, OP. <laughs> like, guys, it's insane how entitled some people can be. Um, I'm only gonna move in if you cover one year of rent, since you owe me a favor for doing you a favor. Oh, okay, and listen to this. So when I first read the story, I was thinking, this guy's gotta be around the same age as the nephew, right? Like, early 20s. Since the guy's acting super immature about things. But no, OP comes into the comments and says that this guy is in his late 40s. Oh my goodness gracious, my friends. Like, that somehow makes me even more angry that he's trying to do that to a 23-year-old, right? Like, get your act together, sir. Alright, so a little backstory. This happened about four months ago. I had just finished an 11-hour shift, and I needed to stop at Home Depot to get a new drill. I just wanted to run in, buy it, run out, and get home. Of course, it wasn't that easy. I had just gotten to the drills and I was looking over the options in my price range when I hear it. I hear, um, excuse me, where are the wax toilet rings? Now, there was a few other people in the area, so I ignore it, assuming there's another employee nearby. Now, it's important to add that as I work in traffic control and just got off a job site, I'm wearing high visibility pants. A high visibility vest shirt that says my company name and traffic control on the back, a radio with a shoulder mic, and I have a traffic control technician certification card displayed on my vest. The employees here wear orange aprons and normal clothes. Again, I hear, hello, do you want to do your job or just stand there looking at tools? At this point, I glanced around to see what was going on. I assumed that some customer was berating an employee, which does happen a lot at this location due to where I live and the people who live here. I was surprised, however, to see some 30-year-old guy in a white button-down shirt and tie looking at me like I'm stupid. I asked him, can I help you? I said that's still unsure of the situation, but that seemed to tick him off, and he said, yes, you can tell me where the damn wax rings are. At this point, it clicked in my head what was going on, and I say, Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I don't... He then interrupts me and says, Listen, I don't want to hear anything but an aisle number, he yelled, interrupting me and drawing the attention of a few other shoppers. He then says, How did you get this job being so stupid? Now, I tried again and said, I don't work. Then he cuts me off and says, Oh my god, are you not hearing what I'm saying? Why is this so hard? Where are the wax rings. Now, I don't know why, but I got this idea in my head that I thought would be amusing. At the very least, it might get him away from me. So I point behind him at some random aisle where I knew the wax rings wouldn't be in, and I said, it's right there. He then yelled, huffed, and stormed off. I thought that was the end of it. I figured he realized that they're not in that aisle, and then find an actual employee to ask. But no, the guy comes right back and starts yelling that I don't even know how to do my job and that his best friend is the district manager, and he'll have my job. During this yelling, I noticed a few shoppers staring at us, and I just raised my hand, pointed at the same aisle as before, and said, They're right there. Look, can't you see them? How stupid can you be, I retorted, taking glee and throwing that last part back at him. But oh boy, he wasn't amused. As I had my arm extended and pointing, he smacks my hand down hard and then shoved me, yelling something about stupid punk teenagers. That was a bad idea. Now, I'm not a skilled fighter and I'm not super strong or anything, but at that point, adrenaline hit, so I punched him square in the nose and he fell back hitting his head on the concrete ground. He then gets up and screams, someone call the police. This guy just attacked me. The crowd nearby grew larger and larger, and I was worried. Obviously, it was in self-defense, but I kept thinking that I should have shoved him back and not punched him. And I was worried that if he hit his head to the point that it caused a lot of damage, that I could get in trouble. Of course, a manager comes over and asks what's going on. The guy then starts screaming, this employee attacked me when I tried to ask for simple directions. Look what he did. By this point, blood is visible on the spot he hit his head, along with the blood pouring out of both of his nostrils. The manager was puzzled and said, Who did? Looking around at actual employees, who were still on their way over to the commotion, the guy screaming, Oh my god, are you guys all this stupid? Him! Pointing to me. Um, he doesn't work here, sir, the manager said. The manager then gets on the radio for more employees, ignoring the man's insistence that I do, and tells me to follow him. He takes me to the security office and has me wait for police. Luckily, multiple customers and the camera saw my side of the story, and since the police went to the injured person first to render aid, they also interviewed witnesses over there, before coming to me. 
When they came in, I gave my side of the story. The police say it contradicts his version of events, but it matches the witness's statements. They said the guy was yelling that he wanted me arrested and locked up, and that's when the manager pulled up the footage, which showed him hitting my hand and shoving me. And I only hit him after that and one time. Also in my favor was the fact that I was facing him with a drill shelf behind me when he shoved me, so I was somewhat cornered. I ended up pressing charges, since he wanted to get me arrested. They arrested him, and a few months later, I found out that he pled guilty and avoided jail time. But now he's got an assault charge on his record. I honestly wouldn't have pressed charges if it wasn't for the fact that he wanted to press charges against me. I hope he learned his lesson and doesn't treat anybody that way again, even if they're a Home Depot employee. Now I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys are happy that OP did press charges, as that's often how these people learn not to do that in the future. Guys, I'm all for self-defense, but when OP wrote that he punched that man in the nose, causing him to fall to the ground bashing his head on the concrete, yikes. That could have ended terribly for both parties. Okay, so this story happened a few days ago. I fly a lot, and I've actually been surprised that the last couple of times, I haven't encountered any entitled people or a-holes. In fact, it went pretty smoothly, and I thought, holy, the curse is lifted. But we wouldn't be here if that had stayed the case, now would we? A few weeks ago, I hurt my ankle doing some filming, and I've been ordered to wear a boot and take it easy while my leg heals. It's been a trying time because I thought I'd be better by now, but the healing process on this injury is a slow one. So I arrive at the airport and I opted for a wheelchair for assistance, given how much my foot was hurting. I'm hobbling around in this giant boot, obviously injured, and now with a wheelchair. So it's probably best to leave me alone, right? Checking in and security go fine. Everyone oozes and awes at my cat while I take him out and hold him so security can do their thing. I don't blame them. My first son is a stunner and a cuddle bug. As they're swiping me for bomb residue, I see a kid between 4 and 7 years old. He nudges his mom and then points at me. I think nothing of it. I put my fur baby back in his carrier and hobble back to the wheelchair. I then grab my bag and shoe and I pop the carrier on my lap. And we're good to head to the gate. I make some conversation with the guy helping me out while I do this. I notice the kid and his mom also have this gate. The guy helping me out finally parks me by the gate. And after petting my cat a bit, he heads off. Now the airport's very crowded. I don't think there's an open seat at our gate at all. Now if you haven't traveled with wheelchair assistance before, usually one of two things will happen. Either they'll leave you at the wheelchair by the gate and you can walk to the plane with the rest of the passengers, or in some cases, they'll directly wheel you to the plane door. This time, I was left by the gate. I put the carrier on the ground next to me and I make sure I have my stuff from security. Eventually, I'm just around on my phone waiting for the flight when I feel a tap on my shoulder. I then pull off my headphones and it's the mom. She's got her crotch goblin next to her. He seems to be interested in my cat, so I watch him slightly to make sure that he doesn't poke or pull on him or do something to hurt him. I don't mind him looking and playing peekaboo though. The mom then says, Excuse me, hi, my name's Karen. Not her real name, obviously. I say to her, Oh, hi Karen, how's it going? At this, she sighs and says, Ugh, I need you to get up. I then ask her, I Is everything okay? Did something roll under my chair? I can move my chair so you can look if you need. The Karen then says to me, no, 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 no. I don't need you to move the chair. I need you out of the chair. I then look at her and say, may I ask why? The Karen then says, look, my son's tired and he needs a place to sit. And clearly there's no seats around. As you can see, the airport's very busy. Now I'm thinking, um, excuse me? I then let out a nervous laugh and say, Oh, I'm sorry. I think I'm just going to stay in the chair. My leg is hurting. And she then interrupts me and says, you're laughing at my child's pain? I say to her, no, 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 I, I, I'm sorry, you just caught me off guard. I thought you needed my help with something. She then says, I do. I need you to get up so my boy can sit. I tell her, as I've said, I'll be staying in my chair. Maybe there's some seats between the gates where you and your son could wait. It wouldn't be a far walk. Karen replies with, are you even listening? He's tired now. If he's tired, why would I make him walk around to look for empty seats? How does that make sense? I tell her, I'm injured. It would also be too far for me to walk and painful to go find my own seats if I were to give up my wheelchair. She then says, we saw you standing in security. You can stand here. She then hits the wall next to me for emphasis and she says, you have somewhere to lean, so please give us the chair. Again, I say to her, no, please leave me alone. She then says, really? 
You won't help a poor child, you're that heartless. Now at this point, I don't say anything. I just grab my headphones and put them back in because this conversation's over, I'm done. Not two minutes later, as I'm minding my own business, engrossed in my phone and ignoring the outside world, I feel this tug on my boot, and then enormous pain going through my foot. The kid is trying to climb onto me. He used my boot as a step stool and tried to hop onto my lap to sit. Obviously, the second I felt him on me, I kind of pushed him off out of instinct. I'm not a jungle gym. Of course, when the Karen sees this, she comes screaming how I could attack her child. The gate attendant also saw the commotion, and she comes over to see what's wrong. Before I can say anything, the Karen screaming to her and says, She hurt my baby. Did you see that? She attacked him. I want her off this flight. So as of right now, I'm still in my chair, the kid's on the ground crying of course, and the Karen's practically trying to shove me out of my chair. I'm still in a fair amount of pain, and now extremely pissed off that this woman's making a scene. The attendant says, Ma'am, what exactly are you trying to do here? The Karen screams at her and says, I need this chair. Look, tell her that she'll be allowed on the plane again if she gets out of the wheelchair and gives me the chair. The attendant says, Ma'am, she's done nothing wrong. Please leave her alone. The chair's for her. She's an injured traveler. The Karen screaming, No, the chair's for people who need it, and right now, my son needs it. She's been rude, and did you not see that she attacked my son? If she won't give me her chair, I want her removed from the flight. The attendant tells her, Ma'am, you are harassing other passengers, and that's not allowed. Now I'm gonna give you one chance to calm down, apologize, before I escalate this. Karen's grasping at straws at this point, and she tries to get me in trouble by screaming, How is she even allowed on a plane with that thing? She then points to my cat and says, That's illegal. That cat is probably feral, and it'll attack everyone during the flight. Now I'm fed off and now pissed that she's going on for so long and says, Lady, I've asked you multiple times to leave me alone. My cat is allowed to be here and travel with me, and it seems that he's a lot better trained and well-behaved than your little boy. Though I'm not surprised he's turning out this way when his mother is behaving like a child. Now get out of my face before I have you charged with harassment. The attendant also tells her, Ma'am, she's allowed to have a cat. It's perfectly legal and within airline rules. Your behavior, however, is not. This is my last warning. Please leave the passenger alone. The Karen is red in the face. She pulls her kid up and starts walking away. And they stand about five feet away from me, just glaring at me. I'm now wary and I'm keeping an eye on them. She then whispers something to her son and before I know it, he's running at me full speed and basically aiming for my cat carrier. I don't know what he planned to do, but my mama cat instincts kicked in and I stuck my leg out just in time. The kid basically jumped and fell on my foot that effectively blocked him from landing on my cat. The attendants had enough. She calls for security and then comes to check on me, as I'm now crying along with the spawn of Satan. The kid runs back to his mom and now the Karen's holding him and she looks ready to tear into me. I then ask her, why would you send your kid to attack me or my cat? This is the second time he's gotten hurt doing something stupid you told him to do. Karen then says, I would never. And that's when her kid says, but mom, you said to sit on the kitty's box and to squish him as hard as I can. Security arrives and the attendant tells them that they need to remove a passenger. And the Karen, for some effing reason, still thinks she's in the right. And she steps aside telling the guys, She's right there. Take her away. She hurt my kid. The attendant and I share a gobsmacked look before she turns to the Karen and says, Ma'am, you and your child will not be allowed to fly with us today. Security will escort you out and your bags will be retrieved when possible. Please gather your things and follow these gentlemen. Hearing this, the woman looked like someone slapped her with a fish, and she says, What do you mean? She's the one who's being rude. You need to kick her off the flight. I'm fine. I haven't done anything wrong. My son and I will be getting on the plane, so we will be staying. The attendant tells her, again, you will not be allowed on the flight, so please leave calmly with these men or they will drag you out. The woman tries to protest some more, but eventually she takes her hellspawn and leaves with security, cussing me out and telling me that Jesus has a special place in hell for people like me. So I get to fly in peace. I had to go to the doctors the next day, and my ankle definitely didn't take those hits well. I'll be in a boot longer than anticipated. The airline did call me to get my statement and offered me vouchers as compensation for my troubles. They also informed me that that passenger has been barred from traveling with their airline in the future. I think they're just happy that I'm not pressing charges. 
What a crazy, crazy story. Like, if your kid's legs are tired, why not just have him sit on the floor, right? Like, why have to pester someone who's clearly injured? From reading all these stories, I'm starting to think that Karen seek out disabled and injured people on purpose. Because that, that's what it feels like, right? Like, the number of stories where Karens force others out of wheelchairs so they can sit, or their kid can sit, is actually mind-boggling to me. Oh, and here's a picture of OP's cat. Okay, so at the time this happened, my friend was raising her child by herself in a suburb in Texas. The area they lived in wasn't particularly safe, with wild beasties of both human and animal kinds, so my friend armed herself with a small pistol and took some gun safety classes to protect her small family. The years go by, and the child is now five, and there was a series of break-ins in the neighborhood, so my friend hired a security company to install security cameras. One day, while reviewing the footage, my friend noticed a strange man lurking around the house. He seemed to wander around a bit, and then wandered away, so my friend shrugged and carried on with her day. Nothing to worry about, right? Well, it turns out, she was wrong. A few days later, my friend was working in her home office, and she saw the same guy walking down her driveway. He then opened the gate and entered her backyard. My friend realized that her kitchen door was left unlocked, and her son was playing in the living room. My friend quickly grabbed her pistol from her purse. She ran to the kitchen and got there as the guy calmly walks through the back door. The guy sauntered in, looked around the room, and froze when he saw my friend with a pistol pointed at him. My friend then screamed, who the F are you, and why are you in my house? At that, the guy gulped, grabbed his phone, and then he dialed 911. He literally tells the operator, Help, I'm standing in this kitchen and some crazy woman has a gun pointed at me. My friend was stunned, but she didn't put her gun down, not moving while staring down the guy who refused to leave. The guy then says, You're gonna get it when the cops show up. To which my friend says, You're in my house, get out. Now, the guy actually stayed in the house until the police came into the kitchen. As soon as the guy saw the cops, he screamed, Arrest her! She's crazy! She has a gun! It was pointed at me! My friend told the cops that it was her house and that he broke in. The cops stopped and stared, looked at the guy and said, You broke in? He then tells them, Well, the door was open and she pulled a gun on me. That's not how it works. Arrest her for having that weapon. Now, the guy obviously forgot he lived in Texas. The cops arrested the guy who was still howling how my friend didn't do it right. Apparently, she wasn't a proper victim. My friend then gave the cops a copy of the video footage of him sniffing around earlier in the week. She never heard anything back from them, so she figured he went to jail. Like, what a freaking idiot, guys. Imagine breaking into someone's home, then calling the cops and getting mad at the homeowner for defending their property against you. Officer, you need to arrest her. That's not how it was supposed to go. She was supposed to let me rob the home while she stood there helpless, and instead, she pointed a pistol at me. So a few years back, I was at Disney World with some friends. Disney had just opened up Pandora, the world of Avatar. Needless to say, the line for the Flight of Passage was insanely long, and it looped throughout the park. So we get in line and wait about two and a half hours. So while we're standing there and chatting, this entitled Karen sneaks in with her husband and two kids, immediately in front of us. Her kids point out to her that this is not the beginning of the line, and she immediately shushes them. She tells the kids that it's okay to cut in line because they have a flight to catch. The husband doesn't say a word. Nobody looks at us. They just pretend nothing happened. Now, my friends were about to say something, but I immediately stop them. My friends look at me confused, to which I whisper, Hey, just watch and learn. We stand in line for about 45 more minutes until we're right at the entrance. And that's when I decide to walk up to security and tell them that this lady cut us in line and she refused to go back to the end. I told him I didn't want to cause a ruckus, so I waited until I found him so he can talk to her. Sure enough, the guard walks up to her and says that she cut the line. She then freaks out on him and says that she didn't, and that she's been standing in line for a while. He then proceeds to ask her how long she's been waiting for, and she says over an hour. To which he replies, the wait for the ride is at least three hours long, so she must have cut in. She was puzzled and frustrated, but she realized she got caught, so she finally stops yelling and agrees to leave. As they escort her and her family out of the line, I look at her and say with a nice smile on my face, have a safe flight. I then look at my friends and tell them, and that's how it's done, boys. We still laugh about it once in a while. 
Oh, those poor kids. Guys, it's always so sad to hear that kids have more sense than their entitled parents. And as for the dad, shame on you, sir, for getting roped into that. But I do kind of feel bad for him, though. He probably realized that it's much easier to stay quiet than to argue with the wife, right? Okay, so I've been scrolling through the sub for quite some time, wondering if any of the stories here are actually true. And then today it happened. So first of all, I drive a red 2005 BMW 3 Series. Nothing too fancy, but I really like my car and I'm kind of proud of it. I'm also 22 years old. I look a lot younger, which is relevant for the story. And I bought it with my own money. And why do I tell you that? Well, I'm flexing, of course. And it's the central point of the story that happened to me today. So this happened today at my local Burger King. I live in a small village and we don't have a Burger King, so I have to drive to the next town if I want to eat there. Today's afternoon, I felt like going there, so I hopped in the car and got onto the Autobahn. A couple of minutes later, I leave the Autobahn and enter the parking lot of said Burger King. I leave my car, walk into the store, and place my order. After a short while, I get my food and leave the shop. I take my car key out of my pocket, walk towards my car, and then press the unlock button. So while I'm opening the door and putting my bag behind the driver's seat, Karen enters the scene. So as I'm putting the seat back into normal position to get ready to leave, she suddenly shows up behind me. Out of nowhere, she says, That's not your car. Who did you steal that from? I say to her, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. How can I help you? Who did you steal it from? That can't be your car. Tell me or I'm calling the police. I tell her the car is mine, that I bought it myself with the money I earned at my job. She then says to me, you're lying. You're not old enough to have a job. Actually, I don't even think you're old enough to drive a car. How old are you? I tell her, ma'am, I do own this car and I'm 22 years old. I've had my license for more than four years now, so I'm very much allowed to drive a car. She then tells me, no you're not, you look like you're 16, I'm gonna call the cops on you. I tell her if she wants to, then do it. The police can come check and I'll show them proof that I do own the car and I have a license. She then says to me, nobody your age should have enough money for a car like this. My son works here and he can't even afford to buy a car. I say to her, listen lady, I'm not 16, I'm 22. I'm a trained IT specialist and I work about 40 hours per week. And I don't want to sound cocky, but I think I earn a little bit more money than someone who works at a fast food place. She then says to me, if you work 40 hours per week, then why are you here in the middle of the day? Now at this point, I'm getting angry. I tell her I have vacation, for Christ's sake, and I'm hungry, so I took my car to get some food. The woman's not listening. She keeps saying that this isn't my car, for me to stop lying, and that she's calling the cops right now. The woman then takes out her phone and starts to call police. After she starts, I can see her son coming out of the store through the front door. He looks at me, standing in my open car door, and his mom talking on the phone and says, Hey, excuse me, that's my mom right there. Is everything alright? Is she calling someone for you? Now I'm still angry, and I say to him, Hey man, I'm not trying to be rude, but is it possible there's something wrong with your mom? She keeps accusing me of stealing my car, and now she's calling police. The woman's son looks at me and says, I'm sorry, she can't can be a little difficult sometimes. He then looks at his mom and says, hey, thanks for picking me up, mom, let's go. To which his mom screams, no, we will wait for police to arrive here. He stole this car. The kid tells his mom very calmly, mom, please relax. We gotta go home. I'm sure he owns this car and he wants to go home too. His mom then screams, no, we will wait until police get here to arrest this thief. The kid looks at me and says, I'm sorry. I tell him it's alright, it's not your fault, let's just wait till police arrive so your mom can see that I actually own this car. So fast forward, a police car arrives in the parking lot and two policemen leave the car. They look around a little and walk towards the three of us. An officer says, hello, did any of you report a car theft? The Karen screams, yes, I did. This boy right here, arrest him, officer. The officer then asks, can someone tell me what's going on here? And the lady says, yes. He stole this car. The officer then says to her, why do you think he stole this car? The woman tells the officer that I'm too young to be driving a car and that I can't own a car like this. The officer then says to me, I'm sorry sir, but can you show me your license and car documents? I told him, wait a minute, I'll go get them. I then proceed to walk around the car to get my car documents out of the glove box. The woman grabs me shouting, Officer, do something, he's clearly trying to run away. The officer tells her to let me go as I'm getting the documents he asked for. 
The woman lets go of me. I walk to the side of my car, open the glove box, and hand the documents over to him. I then take out my wallet and hand over my license too. The officer checks them and of course he says, everything's all right here. The woman keeps saying, no, the car is stolen. My son is older than him and he can't afford a car, so this car is stolen. The officer says, look, it's right here in the documents. This car belongs to OP. That name is also on his driver's license, so the car belongs to the young man. Karen then says, I don't care. The documents and license are fake. Just do your job and arrest him, officer. The woman's clearly not listening. She walks over to me, tries to take my car key, screaming that I don't own it. The officer then tells her, ma'am, please stop or we're going to have to arrest you. She says, you don't have to arrest me. I didn't steal this car. Why don't you do your goddamn job instead of being useless, officer? Arrest this boy. At this point, her son grabs her arm and says, come on, mom, it's his car. He said it. The cop said it. Calm down. Let's go home. Please, mom. The kid is pulling his mom towards the car while she's shouting, I will get that car back to its owner. I swear to God I will. The two then proceed to enter their car and drive away. The officer hands over my license and car documents and says, Hey, do you want to press charges against her? I tell him, no, it's alright. I'm sorry you had to come out here to take care of this situation. He tells me it's okay. It's not even anywhere near the worst situation he's experienced this week. And to have a nice day. The cops get back in their car, enter it, and leave. I finally get into my car too and leave the parking lot to drive home. Now I'm sitting here, eating a cold chili cheeseburger and writing the story. Knowing that the woman's son works at the Burger King, I guess I'll never go there again. I don't want to spend half another afternoon arguing with her and waiting for cops. Yeah guys, that woman definitely sounds like she's got some screws loose. I do have a question though. Could OP have driven away at that point? I mean, he did absolutely nothing wrong. Legally, the car belonged to him and was registered to him. And he had a driver's license. So why the heck did he entertain this crazy lady by standing there waiting for the cops? Can someone please let me know? Like, do you actually have to wait around in situations like this if someone decides to call police on you? So this backstory is important. I met my best friend, who we'll call Janice, on the second day of band class in middle school. We were assigned rotating seats for the first week, to allow us to get to know all the other students in the class, and Janice and I were assigned the first two seats in the back row. This allowed us to get away with more tomfoolery than would normally be allowed. We immediately hit it off, and our friendship only strengthened by our mutual love for playing the trumpet. Let me preface this by saying that Janice was an incredible person. She was one of those people that even though she had a rough childhood, and she was often living day to day not knowing where her next meal was coming from, she never batted an eye, and she still put other people before herself. I put the pieces together one day when she came into class in dirty clothes, and you could tell that she hadn't bathed in a while. I told my mom about it, and she decides to open up our home to her whenever she wanted to come by. Even though we had no problem with her staying with us, she rarely ate meals because she felt shameful for having to rely on my family for those things. After a while, her mom was arrested for a reason that I to this day have not been made aware of, and she was placed into a foster program. I tried to convince my mother to adopt her into the family, but due to a recent divorce and a hit the economy took, my single mom couldn't sustain another person in the household. Eventually, a suitable foster parent was found for her, and everything seemed to be looking up. Oh, did I forget to mention that her foster family was completely loaded? And I mean loaded. You would never know by the way they acted or lived, but her foster mother developed a software company and sold it to a larger company for a ridiculous amount of money. So with that out of the way, it was now the end of 7th grade year. We were having our first major tryout to receive our placement in the advanced 8th grade band. We both realized our passion for playing the instrument as we practiced for hours on end nearly every day together, and both achieved top scores in the section earning her the first chair position and me the second chair. We continued our rigorous practice routine through the summer, and Janice's foster parents paid for the two of us to have private lessons. With this training, we auditioned for the middle school version of All East, and once again, both got the first two chairs. At this point, both of our families began to invest in us by helping us purchase professional instruments for ourselves. My mother and I split the cost of a professional line Yamaha horn. By this point, I had saved up about $1,000 from previous birthdays and holidays, and the other $1,500 was split between my mother and grandparents as a gift. Janice did the same, but she saved up $1,500 over the past several years, and she had planned on using it for college, but I convinced her that investing it in herself could ultimately end up paying more in the end in scholarships. She eventually got on board and talked with her parents about the trumpet. They then reached out to me and told me that they wanted to surprise her with a much better trumpet than she was expecting. I let them know where to look, 
and with some clever work from my side and theirs, we gathered all the information we needed, and they put in the order. A few months later, I get a phone call from her, and at first, I was scared because she was sobbing directly into the phone, and I couldn't understand her. Eventually, she calmed down though, enough to tell me that her new trumpet had come in, but it wasn't the one she was expecting, that I needed to come over right now. Now, I thought I knew what I was going to see when I walked in, but to my utter surprise, it was nothing like I'd expected. When I gave her parents the details and specs of her ideal trumpet, I figured that they were going to find one that was similar in specs and get it for her. But they actually got her a complete custom trumpet to the exact spec that she wanted, but had it plated in a beautiful brush silver finish, with lapis inlaid in the valve finger buttons. It was beyond gorgeous and played like a dream. Now here's where all hell breaks loose, and one of the most unfortunate series of events unfolds. A few years down the road, we're both auditioning for the high school version of All East, as freshmen. If we place in the top section in the top band, we get an invite to audition for All State, which is a huge honor to be a part of. I remember standing outside the door waiting for Janice to get out of her audition when I was approached by another trumpet player, standing in line, followed closely by his entitled parent. He then says to me, Hey, your friend has a very beautiful trumpet. Do you think she would let me play a few notes when she's finished? Now I already knew the answer, as she frequently got asked this at these types of events. So I say, I'm sorry, she doesn't let other people play it because it was a gift to her, and she doesn't want to risk it getting damaged. Now I saw the dismay in his eyes and in his parents, so I quickly remedied the situation and said, she would definitely let you have a good look at it though. We love talking to other people who are interested in different types of trumpets. This seemed to diffuse the situation and we met with him afterwards and had a quite pleasant experience because he was very knowledgeable on the subject and so were we. We got the results for the auditions a few days later and I was incredibly surprised as I got second chair and Janice got fourth. This was incredibly unusual as she was clearly the better player of the two of us but I thought nothing of it. We both qualified for all state auditions and that's all that mattered. A week passes and we're on our way to the all state auditions. My parents drove separate and I rode with Janice. She went to kindergarten late a year and had a late birthday, thus she had her license as a freshman. We arrive and meet the same kid and his parents in the parking lot. We have a slightly more awkward encounter, but again, I think nothing of it and just blame it on the nerves. We go into the auditions and both do wonderful. That night, we get a call, and they told us that she got first chair and I got third. Now that was an incredible moment, and that night, we stayed up on the phone planning our future as two people that would travel the globe and wow people with our wonderful trumpet playing. The next morning, we hurried to the practice hall to get an early warm-up. The rehearsal went astoundingly well, and Janice had one of the most beautiful solos that I'd ever heard. The next morning during practice, we had lunch break, and while Janice was getting out of her seat, she trips on a bottle of valve oil and landed trumpet first into the ground. I immediately rushed over to make sure she was okay, but she had hit her head on the side of the stand and put a serious dent in the bell of her trumpet. She then began to fall apart because she felt she had let her foster parents down by damaging the gift that they gave her. She sprung up after a few seconds and the shock began to settle, and she asked if I could hold onto the trumpet while she went to the bathroom to clean the cut that she got from the stand. A few hours passed and I hadn't heard anything from her. I continued to call her number, but nothing. I began to worry when I got a phone call from my parents. I could hear sirens in the background and my mom was crying. She told me to meet them out front, and they would pick me up and take me back to the hotel. Now I felt sick in my stomach and had an overwhelming feeling of dread. I continued to look for Janice while waiting on my parents. I wanted to let her know what was going on and talk to her about what happened, as she was clearly upset. As my parents pulled into the parking lot, I get into the car. They then drove to a spot near the back, and they turned the car off. I asked what was going on, and my mom explained to me that Janice was driving back to the hotel, and she ran a red light. She was then t-boned by a truck, and she was killed in the crash. Now I had no words, and I still have no words. I just sat there clutching the scratched and dented trumpet in my arms, with tears rolling down my face. My tears were not accompanied by anything, no emotion, just a feeling of void. I even lashed out at my parents, accusing them of a cruel joke, but it was true. My best friend, whom I considered my sister, was gone, just like that. No goodbye, nothing. That was it. So two weeks came and went, and the postponed Allstate concert was approaching. We had a ceremony at the first practice for her, but by this point, I had attempted to numb myself to avoid dealing with the loss, so I didn't participate. I brought her trumpet with me to practice one day because for some reason, it brought me comfort to have it near. It was set up on its stand next to me when I was once again approached by the entitled mom. She asked me what happened to the trumpet, to which I replied, oh, she tripped while she was carrying it and dinged it up pretty bad. The woman then asked me politely if her son could play with it now that it was damaged. 
I told her, no, she trusted me with it, so I have to keep it safe. The woman then says, oh, come on, it's just for one song. I tell her, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. The woman starts yelling now and says, are you serious? All my son wants to do is play with your stupid friend's beat up trumpet, and you won't even let him touch it? He got to hold it before, so why can't he play it now? Now, I was taken aback by this whole scenario and just stood there with my mouth agape. But she continued, addressing the few kids left in the room and says, Can you believe this? This boy thinks he's so much better than my son that he won't even let him use his dead girlfriend's trumpet. At this point, I'm fuming. I start to retort, but I don't get far before I get too choked up to keep talking. The woman goes on and says, Why on earth do you need to keep it safe anyway? It's not like she's gonna need it anytime soon. The least you can do is make my son happy by letting him play the trumpet. He can play it way better than she could anyway. Now at this point, my emotional barriers that I put up to control my feelings were completely overwhelmed, and I began to sob. She then reached over me and attempted to grab the trumpet when the director walks into the room and saw what's going on. He hurried over to where we were, but the woman scurries out of the building before he could get to her. He immediately calls police. By this point, the emotional dam I built had busted, and all I could do to comfort me was to keep her trumpet in my lap as I wailed and sobbed. I had a full breakdown and I didn't stop for nearly an hour after my parents came and got me. The concert was cancelled, and the mom and child were never allowed to participate in all state performances again. And I received no confirmation of this, but I've been told that he was kicked out of his high school band program. We were encouraged to press charges against her, but I refused because I didn't want any more emotional weight at the time, and I figured it was some sort of moral high road. Looking back, I almost wished I pressed charges. Anyone who would have the audacity to do something like that, to a child, mind you, needs some serious help, and I think that would have been a good wake-up call. Now to end on a more positive note, I have continued to pursue our passion and perform music across the country. And since that day, I've performed every gig, concert, etc, etc on her trumpet, exactly how she left it. It still gives me comfort to have it near, as I feel a bit of her still with me when I have it. I hope you enjoyed this marvelous story from my childhood, and I do apologize for the length. But I felt that the full context of the story was needed. I also feel it's important to address that this happened a long time ago, and my memory might have lost a little on the details, but I tried to keep it to what was most solid in my memory. I appreciate the read, and hope every one of you is doing well. Guys, entitled people never cease to amaze me. Like, I'm baffled by the audacity of that woman to say something so outrageous to OP in a time like that. And on top of that, try to grab the trumpet out of OP's hands. But hey, are you guys surprised? Like, the amount of stories I read where people clearly give no crap about anybody else in the world is ridiculous. Okay, so this story happened on a Saturday, the day before Halloween. We all knew it was going to be a long shift, and we'd probably get a couple of crazies, but boy oh boy, we didn't expect this level of crazy. So to set the scene, our Italian restaurant is fairly small. A very small section in the front, and a slightly larger section in the back where the bar and kitchen are. Now this couple, a male and female, walk into the restaurant. They didn't book, but that was okay. We had enough space for a few walk-ins. So I greet them, and sit them down at a table in the front, and then asked if they had allergies or intolerances, and they said they did not. I got their drink orders, but nothing else, as they were still deciding on what to eat. At this point, everything was pretty normal. So while the drinks were being made, literally like 5 seconds after the order was put through, I go to another table to make sure everything's alright with them, and this woman is snapping her fingers and shouting me over saying, Excuse me, could you come back here please? The whole time she's snapping her fingers repeatedly, as if to say, hurry up. So I finish with the customer and go over to the couple and say, yes, are you ready to order? She goes and rattles off her order, and so does her partner. I put their order through, and luckily nothing bad happened while they waited for the meals. So at this point, the food is ready. So I bring over the starters, and as soon as the plates touch the table, she starts demanding that I get various things for the meal, which I was just about to offer. Now, that was fine, it's just the way they said it, and I was starting to stress out a little since I was running food, drinks, and making sure the other tables were happy. Now, we still don't know how it happened, but amidst all the chaos, this couple's mane comes out while they're still halfway through their starters. The Karen calls me over, snapping her fingers and says, I'm not impressed with this service. To which I say, I'm so sorry about the mix-up. If you like, I can take the mains back and get them redone for you so you don't have to rush and it doesn't get cold. At this, she just gruffly says, no, and waves me away. I take a glance at her partner, and he's happily enjoying his meal already. 
After a couple of minutes, I hear more finger snapping and I get called back again. She says, this pasta you've cooked is so dry. Once again, I say, I'm really sorry about that. If you'd like, I can have the kitchen redo it or I can get them to put more sauce on it so it's not so dry. I then put my hand out in a gesture to take the bowl away, but she literally cradles the damn bowl and says, no, bring me some garlic butter. So I do. A few minutes later, I'm with another table near the couple, and she shouts for me, snapping her fingers yet again. And all seems to be an absolute rage. She's screaming, look what I found in my food. Now since I'm with another table, I just quickly say, one moment please, and ask the table that I'm with if it's okay if I go see them, and I'll be right back. They agree. So I walk to Karen, and she says, look at this. This is a nut. I'm allergic to nuts. Now, as soon as she said that, I am a little taken aback and say, oh, right, well, it doesn't look like a nut. It looks like a pip of a lemon, but I'll go check if the dish has nuts in it. Now, I know for a fact that the dish doesn't have nuts in it, and there's a squeezed lemon on her plate, so it's definitely a seed. But before I leave her, she starts gulping down water, hyperventilating, and literally pretending to go into anaphylactic shock holding her throat and screaming, you've ruined my night, you have ruined my food, this food is all bland and tasteless and it's got nuts in it, and I'm allergic to nuts, I'd better be compensated. She then proceeds to shove her plate at me. So I take her food away, go to my manager and explain what's been happening. We take her main meal off the bill because we'd rather just have her leave right now and not cause any more arguments. But just so we can cover ourselves, the manager does go over to her. He explains that her meal was taken off, but since I asked her if she had any allergies before they sat down, it's out of our hands, especially because we asked, and it seems like she withheld that information. The woman then starts screaming, but I didn't know I was allergic to nuts until I had one today. The manager wasn't having it, so he just calmly and point blank said to her face, ma'am, it was a lemon seed. The woman ignored him and she kept screaming, you've ruined my wedding night. You've ruined my anniversary. I am so disappointed and I'm never coming back here. Then they both walk out of the restaurant. But a few minutes later, the husband comes in and he embarrassingly asked if he left his cardigan here. He didn't. But then he says, I'm so sorry about tonight. You have been wonderful. Sometimes my wife's just a little bit. He then gestures the crazy symbol to his head. And just before he completely walks out the door to his angry and patient wife, he smiles and says, thanks for trying to make this evening pleasant. You've been great. Now, the best part is all the tables who saw what happened start laughing. And they asked us to get their meals comped or discounted because they too have allergies. They're allergic to dickheads. Yeah, I think I would have totally called her bluff and dialed 911 at that point, guys. Like, if she wants to play those games where she snaps her fingers at servers and acts all high and mighty, then she definitely deserves to pay some sort of a-hole tax by having to pay for an ambulance ride that night. Also, could you imagine if someone mistook her little fake anaphylactic shock as a real thing and just ran up and jabbed her with a frickin' EpiPen? So this story happened five years ago. So I'm a mailman and my route consists of a single stop with 65 community boxes for a large gated community of 800 houses. Now each community box has 8 to 16 mailboxes in it, 1 to 2 lockers for parcels, and 1 outgoing mail slot. Each box has a master lock that opens the entire front of the box, so I can access all the mailboxes inside of it without having to open all of them individually. The boxes are set up in four rows, and it takes me about an hour to deliver each row. I am also paid by salary, not hourly, so the faster I get done, the more per hour I get paid, which is a great incentive to find ways to cut time out of my day. One way I do this is I'll split the mail into four sections, one for each row of boxes, instead of bundling mail for each box individually. I then open all the boxes on that row, go through all the flats, which are magazines, legal envelopes and such, and then go through with the letters, and then with the packages, then lock everything up and move on to the next row. I've been doing this route for 20 years now, and most of the people there know me by sight. I'm friendly with a few, and whenever someone I don't know approaches while working, I let them know my rules. These are my rules. You do not reach into any mailbox that I currently have open. If you need your mail now and you can't come back later, tell me which of the boxes your mailbox is in. I will close it for you so you can unlock your individual mailbox and get your mail from it. I will also not deliver out of order. 
no matter how big a hurry you happen to be in, because the mail comes in a specific order, and it's a pretty large waste of my time to dig through and find yours. I also do not permit children to be near any box that's open, because you never know what a kid's gonna grab, and grab they do. I know from experience. So along comes Little Miss Entitled Karen. Now, this being a rather wealthy, gated community, you'd think I'd run into them more often, but the people here are usually really polite and respectful of my rules. So you know the type. Bleach blonde bob cut, pantsuit, and shoes that probably cost more than my mortgage payment. She walks right up to me as I'm just starting to unload everything from my mail truck, and she demands to know which mailbox is hers. She doesn't tell me her name, doesn't tell me her address, she just walks up and demands to know which mailbox is hers. Now you might be wondering how she could possibly not know. When there's 800 mailboxes and 65 community boxes, it can be a little daunting to figure out which box is yours when you first move in. So in this situation, there's a few questions I ask to figure out the best way to help someone. So I start with, have you received a set of mail keys yet? To which she replied, I don't see how that's any of your business. Now, meanwhile, her son, who's probably 8 to 10 years old, is starting to pick through the mail that I've already unloaded. Now I have kids. I know how to talk to kids. So I tell him he needs to stop playing with the mail. Not loud, not mean, but firm. And Karen absolutely explodes over this. She starts screaming how I had no right to order her son around like that. When she finally yelled herself out, I told her what the boy was doing was called tampering with the mail. That's a felony. And as his legal guardian, she would be held responsible if he didn't stop. So she made a token, get away from there, comment to her kid. And he moved off to play on the grass nearby. So I get her info and showed her which box was hers. Her box was in the last row, so I wouldn't be getting to it until the very end. She then opened it and found all the mail that came for her before she got her key. She flipped through it to make sure it was all hers. As she was doing that, her son starts poking around the mail again. Since it's his second warning, I was a lot sharper when I told him to get away this time, and he starts crying. Now as soon as he starts crying, Karen screams, don't yell at my son, and reached out to slap me. I told her if she did that again, that I'm gonna have to call the police, and I would be pressing assault charges, and that she and her boy needs to get away from the mail. She then told me if I called police, she would tell them that I tried to assault her. At this point, she just stands there, and I was like, what? And she says, what about today's mail? I told her of my rules, and that I wouldn't be getting to her box for a few hours. And she looked like she was gonna lose it again, but she just walks off in a frustrated huff. She doesn't go far though, she just walks over a ways away from the mailbox and stood there like she was gonna wait for me to get to her mailbox just out of sheer spite or something. So I went back to unloading. I opened up all the boxes on the first row and started delivery. Her kid comes over for a closer look, and that's fine, as long as he stays back and keeps his hands to himself. Kids are curious, and often surprised by how the community boxes open up and want a closer look. I tell him that he could watch, but he needs to stay back. Thankfully, Karen didn't hear this, or I imagine she'd be screaming at me again. I finished up the first row, and I looked over, and Karen was still there waiting. She was glaring at me and telling me to work faster. So before I get started on the second row, I make a quick call to my supervisor at the post office and let her know everything that's happened so far. She tells me that if Karen should approach me again, I was to start filming her with my phone, so there would be video evidence if things escalated. Now this is what sealed Karen's fate in the end, and saved me from wrongful accusations, so I'm glad she told me to do it. So I get back to work, open all the boxes on the second row, and start delivering. The kid was back watching me, but this time, he moved right up to me and reached into one of the mailboxes as I put a magazine into it, like he was gonna grab the magazine. At which point, I grab him by the wrist, pulled his hand out, and told him in a very low, serious voice that if he did that again, that things were gonna get nasty. At this point, I tell the woman to please take her son away so I can do my job. So what does the kid do? He reaches into the box, pulls out the magazine, and he tears it in half. At this very point, I'm at the absolute end of my patience with these people, so I lose it. I start yelling at the kid, I start yelling at Karen, Karen starts yelling at me, I then pull out my phone and start filming her, and that's when she loses it. 
The woman goes on a rampage. She starts flipping all my trays of mail over, throwing it all over the place, throwing packages around, and she even reaches into open mailboxes, grabbing the mail to toss on the ground to undo my work. I got it all on film as I was trying to stop her. This whole time, she keeps screaming, don't you put your hands on me, and then she pulls out her phone and calls police. She tells them that the mailman tried to force himself on her, and she needs officers there immediately, as I'm filming everything. So at this point, I stopped filming and called my supervisor. My supervisor then calls police and the postal inspectors, who have the same authority as US Marshals. My supervisor shows up first. I explain everything that happened again, and showed her the video. She starts ripping into Karen, while Karen keeps trying to say that I tried to assault her, sexually. My supervisor then grabs my phone and shoves it right up into her face and screamed, Yeah, I can see that actually happened from the video evidence that shows nothing of the sort. The police showed up next and looked kind of at a loss for what they were supposed to do. The mail looked like a bomb went off. There's my supervisor screaming at Karen and not even letting her get a word in. And then there's Karen's kid. He's happily opening up as many packages and ripping letters in half as he can get his hands on. And then the postal inspectors show up. Now, the postal inspectors have no sense of humor. They also don't take any BS from anyone. They looked at the mess, looked at the video I recorded, and they took my statement. They then arrested Karen for tampering with the mail, and for allowing a minor in her care to open mail that's not addressed to her. My supervisor had to send four other carriers over to help clean up the mess, and we were there well after dark, getting it sorted out and put into the boxes. So in the end, Karen went to trial. I was brought in to give my version of events. In the end, Karen was sentenced to the maximum of three years in prison, and she had to pay a $250,000 fine. And I got a week off work to deal with my own anxiety over the whole thing. People, I don't care how pissed off you are, or what you think you're doing. Do not mess with the mail. You will go to prison for it. Guys, what a freaking crazy fallout to that story. And seriously, I thought tree law was satisfying. And honestly, I didn't even know how serious tampering and destroying other people's mail was until I started reading stories like this. So for all of you who don't know how serious tampering with mail is, here's a bit of info. So because the United States Postal Service is a federal agency, mailboxes are considered federal property, and mail theft is charged as a federal offense. If you are charged with mail theft, you could face up to 5 years in federal prison and fines of up to $250,000. It's also a crime to injure, deface, or destroy any mail that's deposited into a mailbox. For each act of vandalism, you could be imprisoned for up to 3 years and fined up to $250,000. And depending on the manner in which the mail theft is committed, you could face other criminal charges, such as assault and breaking and entering. If personal identifying information such as names, date of birth, addresses, telephone numbers, tax ID numbers, social security numbers, and driver's license numbers was stolen, you could also face identity theft charges. So there you have it, folks. If you're going to rage at a mailman, make sure you don't touch the mail, just like OP said. Or you might go to jail. And that, my friends, brings us to an end of the most entitled stories ever on this channel in 2022. Guys, if you enjoyed the stories, hit subscribe. If you stayed for the full episode, hey, thank you for staying for the whole episode, I guess. And if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so you don't miss these crazy, crazy stories. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.